Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter forty one. Suspicion. Fanny is sent for. Bathsheba said very little to her husband all that evening of their return from market, and he was not disposed to say much to her. He exhibited the unpleasant combination of a restless condition with his silent tongue. The next day, which was Sunday, passed nearly in the same manner as regarded their taciturnity, Bathsheba going to church both morning and afternoon. This was the day before the Budmouth races. In the evening Troy said suddenly, Bathsheba, could you let me have twenty pounds? Her countenance instantly sank. Twenty pounds? she said. The fact is, I want it badly. The anxiety upon Troy's face was unusual and very marked. It was a culmination of the mood he had been in all the day. Ah, for those races tomorrow. Troy for the moment made no reply. Her mistake had its advantages to a man who shrank from having his mind inspected as he did now. "'Well, suppose I do want it for the races,' he said at last. "'Oh, Frank,' Bathsheba replied, and there was such a volume of entreaty in the words. "'Only such a few weeks ago you said that I was far sweeter than all your other pleasures put together, and that you would give them all up for me, and now you won't give up this one which is more a worry than a pleasure?' Do, Frank, come, let me fascinate you by all I can do, by pretty words and pretty looks, and everything I can think of, to stay at home. Say yes to your wife, say yes. The tenderest and softest phases of Bathsheba's nature were prominent now, advanced impulsively for his acceptance, without any of the disguises and offences which the weariness of her character, when she was cool, too frequently threw over them. Few men could have resisted the arch yet dignified entreaty of the beautiful face, thrown a little back and sideways in the well-known attitude that expresses more than the words it accompanies, and which seems to have been designed for these special occasions. Had the woman not been his wife, Troy would have succumbed instantly. As it was, he thought he would not deceive her longer. "'The money is not wanted for racing debts at all,' he said. "'What is it for?' she asked. You worry me a great deal by these mysterious responsibilities, Frank. Troy hesitated. He did not now love her enough to allow himself to be carried too far by her ways, yet it was necessary to be civil. You wrong me by such a suspicious manner, he said. Such straight waistcoating as you treat me to is not becoming in you at so early a date. I think that I have a right to grumble a little if I pay— she said, with features between a smile and a pout. Exactly. And the former being done, suppose we proceed to the latter. Bathsheba, fun is all very well, but don't go too far, or you may have cause to regret something. She reddened. I do that already, she said quickly. What do you regret? That my romance has come to an end. All romances end at marriage. I wish you wouldn't talk like that. You grieve me to my soul by being smart at my expense. You are dull enough at mine. I believe you hate me. Not you. Only your faults. I do hate them. It would be much more becoming if you set yourself to cure them. Come, let's strike a balance with the twenty pounds and be friends. She gave a sigh of resignation. I have about that sum here for household expenses. If you must have it, take it. Very good. Thank you. I expect I shall have gone away before you're in to breakfast tomorrow. And must you go? Ah, there was a time, Frank, when it would have taken a good many promises to other people to drag you away from me. You used to call me darling then. But it doesn't matter to you how my days are passed now. I must go, in spite of sentiment. Troy, as he spoke, looked at his watch, and, apparently actuated by non lucendo principles, opened the case at the back, revealing, snugly stowed within it, a small coil of hair. Bathsheba's eyes had been accidentally lifted at that moment, and she saw the action, and she saw the hair. She flushed in pain and surprise, and some words escaped her before she had thought whether or not it was wise to utter them. "'A woman's curl of hair,' she said. "'Oh, Frank!' Whose is that? Troy had instantly closed his watch. He carelessly replied, 
as one who cloaked some feelings that the sight had stirred. "'Why, yours, of course. Whose should it be? I had quite forgotten that I had it.' "'What a dreadful fib, Frank!' "'I tell you I had forgotten it,' he said loudly. "'I don't mean that. It was yellow hair.' "'Nonsense!' "'That's insulting me. I know it was yellow. Now whose was it, I want to know?' "'Very well, I'll tell you. So make no more ado. It is the hair of a young woman I was going to marry before I knew you.' "'You ought to tell me her name, then.' "'I cannot do that.' "'Is she married yet?' "'No. Is she alive?' "'Yes. Is she pretty?' "'Yes.' It is wonderful how she can be, poor thing, under such an awful affliction. An affliction? What affliction? he inquired quickly. Having hair of that dreadful colour. Ho, 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 I like that, said Troy, recovering himself. Why, her hair has been admired by everybody who has seen her since she has worn it loose, which has not been long. It is beautiful hair. People used to turn their heads to look at it, poor girl. Phew, that's nothing. "'That's nothing,' she exclaimed in incipient accents of pique. "'If I cared for your love so much as I used to, I could say people had turned to look at mine.' "'Bathsheba, don't be so fitful and jealous. You knew what married life would be like, and shouldn't have entered it if you feared these contingencies.' Troy had by this time driven her to bitterness. Her heart was big in her throat, and the ducts to her eyes were painfully full. Ashamed as she was to show emotion, at last she burst out. "'This is all I get for loving you so well. Ah, when I married you, your life was dearer to me than my own. I would have died for you. How truly I can say that I would have died for you. And now you sneer at my foolishness in marrying you. Oh, is it kind to me to throw my mistake in my face? Whatever opinion you may have of my wisdom, you should not tell me it so mercilessly, now that I am in your power.' "'I can't help how things fall out,' said Troy. Upon my heart, women will be the death of me. Well, you shouldn't keep people's hair. You'll burn it, won't you, Frank? Frank went on as if he had not heard her. There are considerations, even before my consideration for you, uh, reparations to be made, ties you know nothing of. If you repent of marrying, so do I. Trembling now, she put her hand upon his arm, saying, in mingled tones of wretchedness and coaxing, I only repent it if you don't love me better than any woman in the world. I don't otherwise, Frank. You don't repent because you already love somebody better than you love me, do you? I don't know. Why do you say that? You won't burn that curl. You like the woman who owns that pretty hair. Yes, it is pretty, more beautiful than my miserable black mane. Well, it's no use. I can't help being ugly. You must like her best, if you will. Until today, when I took it from a drawer, I have never looked upon that bit of hair for several months. That I am ready to swear. But just now you said ties, and then that woman we met. It was the meeting with her that reminded me of the hair. Is it hers, then? Yes. There, now that you have wormed it out of me, I hope you are content. And what are the ties? Oh, that meant nothing, a mere jest. A mere jest? she said in mournful astonishment. Can you jest when I am so wretchedly in earnest? Tell me the truth, Frank. I am not a fool, you know, although I am a woman and have my woman's moments. Come, treat me fairly, she said, looking honestly and fearlessly into his face. I don't want much. Bear justice, that's all. Ah, once I felt I could be content with nothing less than the highest homage from the husband I should choose. Now... Anything short of cruelty will content me. Yes, the independent and spirited Bathsheba is come to this. For heaven's sake, don't be so desperate, said Troy snappishly, rising as he did so and leaving the room. Directly he had gone, Bathsheba burst into great sobs, dry-eyed sobs which cut as they came, without any softening by tears. But she determined to repress all evidences of feeling. She was conquered. But she would never own it as long as she lived. Her pride was indeed brought low by despairing discoveries of her spoliation by marriage with a less pure nature than her own. She chafed to and fro in rebelliousness, like a caged leopard. Her whole soul was in arms, and the blood fired her face. 
Until she had met Troy, Bathsheba had been proud of her position as a woman. It had been a glory to her to know that her lips had been touched by no man's on earth, that her waist had never been encircled by a lover's arm. She hated herself now. In those earlier days she had always nourished a secret contempt for girls who were the slaves of the first good-looking young fellow who should choose to salute them. She had never taken kindly to the idea of marriage in the abstract, as did the majority of women she saw about her. In the turmoil of her anxiety for her lover, she had agreed to marry him, but the perception that had accompanied her happiest hours on this account was rather that of self-sacrifice than of promotion and honour. Although she scarcely knew the divinity's name, Diana was the goddess whom Bathsheba instinctively adored. That she had never, by look, word, or sign, encouraged a man to approach her, that she had felt herself sufficient to herself, and had, in the independence of her girlish heart, fancied there was a certain degradation in renouncing the simplicity of a maiden existence, to become the humbler half of an indifferent matrimonial whole, were facts now bitterly remembered. Oh, if she had never stooped to folly of this kind, respectable as it was, and could only stand again as she had stood on the hill at Norcombe, and dare Troy or any other man to pollute a hair of her head by his interference. The next morning she arose earlier than usual, and had the horse saddled for her ride round the farm in the customary way. When she came in at half-past eight, their usual hour for breakfasting, she was informed that her husband had risen, taken his breakfast, and driven off to Casterbridge with the gig and poppet. After breakfast she was cool and collected, quite herself in fact, and she rambled to the gate, intending to walk to another quarter of the farm, which she still personally superintended as well as her duties in the house would permit, continually, however, finding herself preceded in forethought by Gabriel Oak, for whom she had begun to entertain the genuine friendship of a sister. Of course, she sometimes thought of him in the light of an old lover, and had momentary imaginings of what life with him as a husband would have been like, also of life with Boldwood under the same conditions. But Bathsheba, though she could feel, was not much given to futile dreaming, and her musings under this head were short and entirely confined to the times when Troy's neglect was more than ordinarily evident. She saw coming up the road a man like Mr. Boldwood. It was Mr. Boldwood. Bathsheba blushed painfully and watched. The farmer stopped when still a long way off, and held up his hand to Gabriel Oak, who was in a footpath across the field. The two men then approached each other and seemed to engage in earnest conversation. Thus they continued for a long time. Joseph Poorgrass now passed near them, wheeling a barrow of apples up the hill to Bathsheba's residence. Boldwood and Gabriel called to him, spoke to him for a few minutes, and then all three parted, Joseph immediately coming up the hill with his barrow. Bathsheba, who had seen this pantomime with some surprise, experienced great relief when Boldwood turned back again. "'Well, what's the message, Joseph?' she said. He set down his barrow, and, putting upon himself the refined aspect that a conversation with a lady required, spoke to Bathsheba over the gate. "'You'll never see Fanny Robin no more. "'Use not principal, ma'am.' "'Why?' "'Because she's dead in the Union.' "'Fanny? Dead? Never?' "'Yes, ma'am. "'What did she die from?' "'I don't know for certain, "'but I should be inclined to think it was from general neshness of constitution. "'She was such a limber maid, and it could stand no hardship, even when I knowed her.' "'and I went like a candle-snuff, so to said. "'She was took bad in the morning, "'and, being quite feeble and worn out, "'she died in the evening. "'She belongs by law to our parish, "'and Mr. Boldwood is going to send a wagon at three this afternoon "'to fetch her home here and bury her. "'Indeed, I shall not let Mr. Boldwood do any such thing. "'I shall do it. "'Fanny was my uncle's servant, "'and although I only knew her for a couple of days, "'she belongs to me.' How very, very sad this is, the idea of Fanny being in a workhouse. Bathsheba had begun to know what suffering was, and she spoke with real feeling. Send across to Mr. Boldwood's to say that Mrs. Troy will take upon herself the duty of fetching an old servant of the family. We ought not to put her in a wagon. We'll get a hearse. There will hardly be any time, ma'am, will there? Perhaps not. 
she said musingly. "'When did you say we must be at the door? Three o'clock?' Three o'clock this afternoon, ma'am, so to speak, eh? Very well. You go with it. A pretty wagon is better than an ugly hearse, after all. Joseph, have the new spring wagon with the blue body and red wheels, and wash it very clean. And Joseph— Yes, ma'am? Carry with you some evergreens and flowers to put upon her coffin. Indeed, gather a great many, and completely bury her in them. Get some boughs of laurestines, and variegated box, and yew, and boy's love, ay, and some bunches of chrysanthemum, and let old Pleasant draw her, because she knew him so well. I will, ma'am. I ought to have said that the union, in the form of four labourer men, will meet me when I get to our churchyard gate, and take her and bury her according to the rights of the board of guardians, as by law ordained. Dear me, Casterbridge Union! "'And is Fanny come to this?' said Bathsheba, musing. "'I wish I had known it sooner. "'I thought she was far away. "'How long has she lived there?' "'Only been a day or two. "'Oh, then she has not been staying there as a regular inmate. "'No. "'She first went to live in a garrison town to other side of Wessex, "'and since then she's picked up a living at Seamstering in Melchester for several months.' at the house of a very respectable widow-woman who takes in work of that sort. She only got handy the Union House on Sunday morning, I believe, and tis supposed here and there that she has traipsed every step of the way from Melchester. Why she left her place I can't say, for I don't know, and as to a lie, why I wouldn't tell it. That's the short of the story, ma'am. Ah! No gem ever flashed from a rosy ray to a white one more rapidly than changed the young wife's countenance whilst this word came from her in a long-drawn breath. "'Did she walk along our turnpike road?' she said in a suddenly restless and eager voice. "'I believe she did. Ma'am, shall I call Liddy? You bain't well, ma'am, surely. You look like a lily, so pale and fainty.' "'No, don't call her. It is nothing. When did she pass Weatherbury?' last Saturday night. That will do, Joseph. Uh, now you may go. Certainly, ma'am. Uh, Joseph, come hither a moment. What was the colour of Fanny Robin's hair? Really, mistress, now that tis put to me so judge and jury-like, I can't call to mind, if you'll believe me. Never mind. Go on and do what I told you. Uh, stop. Well, well, no, go on. She turned herself away from him, that he might no longer notice the mood which had set its sign so visibly upon her, and went indoors with a distressing sense of faintness and a beating brow. About an hour after she heard the noise of the wagon and went out, still with a painful consciousness of her bewildered and troubled look. Joseph, dressed in his best suit of clothes, was putting in the horse to start. The shrubs and flowers were all piled in the wagon, as she had directed. Bathsheba hardly saw them now. "'Whose sweetheart did you say, Joseph?' "'I don't know, ma'am. Are you quite sure?' "'Yes, ma'am, quite sure.' "'Sure of what?' "'I'm sure that all I know is that she arrived in the morning and died in the evening, without further parley. What Oka Mr. Boldwood told me was only these few words. "'Little Fanny Robin is dead, Joseph.' "'Gabriel said, looking in my face in his steady old way. "'I was very sorry, and I said, "'Ah, and how did she come to die? "'Well, she's dead in Casterbridge Union,' he said, "'and perhaps tis a much matter about how she came to die. "'She reached the Union early Sunday morning "'and died in the afternoon. "'That's clear enough. "'Then I asked what she'd been doing lately, "'and Mr. Boldwood turned round to me then. "'He let off, spitting a thistle with the end of his stick.' He told me about her having lived by Seamstring in Melchester, as I mentioned to you, and that she walked there from at the end of last week, passing near here Saturday night in the dusk. They then said, I had better just name a hint of her death to you, and away they went. Her death might have been brought on by biding in the night wind, you know, ma'am, for people used to say she'd go off in a decline. She used to cough a good deal in the winter time. However, tis a much odds to us about that now, for tis all over. Have you heard a different story at all? She looked at him so intently that Joseph's eyes quailed. Not a word, mistress, I assure ye, he said, 
Hardly anybody in the parish knows the news yet. I wonder why Gabriel didn't bring the message to me himself. He mostly makes a point of seeing me upon the most trifling errand. These words were merely murmured, and she was looking upon the ground. Perhaps he was busy, ma'am, Joseph suggested, and sometimes he seems to suffer from things upon his mind, connected with a time when he was better off than he is now. Is rather a curious item, but a very understanding shepherd, and learned in books. Did anything seem upon his mind whilst he was speaking to you about this? I cannot but say that I did, ma'am. He was terrible down, and so was Farmer Boldwood. Thank you, Joseph, that will do. Go on now, or you'll be late. Bathsheba, still unhappy, went indoors again. In the course of the afternoon she said to Liddy, who had been informed of the occurrence, "'What was the colour of poor Fanny Robin's hair? Do you know? I cannot recollect. I only saw her for a day or two. "'It was light, ma'am, but she wore it rather short, and packed away under her cap, so that you would hardly notice it, but I have seen her let her hair down when she was going to bed. And it looked beautiful then, real golden hair.' "'Her young man was a soldier, was he not?' "'Yes, in the same regiment as Mr. Troy.' He says he knew him very well. What? Mr. Troy says so. How came he to say that? One day I just named it to him, and asked him if he knew Fanny's young man. He said, Oh, yes, he knew the young man as well as he knew himself, and that there wasn't a man in the regiment he liked better. Ah, said that, did he? Yes, and he said there was a strong likeness between himself and the other young man, so that sometimes people mistook them. Liddy, for heaven's sake, stop your talking, said Bathsheba, with a nervous petulance that comes from worrying perceptions. End of chapter 41 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 42 Joseph and his Burden Book's Head A wall bounded the site of Casterbridge Union House, except along a portion of the end. Here a high gable stood prominent, and it was covered, like the front, with a mat of ivy. In this gable was no window, chimney, ornament, or protuberance of any kind. The single feature appertaining to it, beyond the expanse of dark green leaves, was a small door. The situation of the door was peculiar. The sill was three or four feet above the ground, and for a moment one was at a loss for an explanation of this exceptional altitude till ruts immediately beneath suggested that the door was used solely for the passage of articles and persons to and from the level of a vehicle standing on the outside. Upon the whole, the door seemed to advertise itself as a species of traitor's gate translated to another sphere. That entry and exit hereby was only at rare intervals became apparent on noting that tufts of grass were allowed to flourish undisturbed in the chinks of the sill. As the clock over the South Street Arms House pointed to five minutes to three, a blue spring wagon, picked out with red and containing boughs of flowers, passed the end of the street and up towards this side of the building. Whilst the chimes were yet stammering out a shattered form of Malbrook, Joseph Poorgrass rang the bell and received directions to back his wagon against the high door under the gable. The door then opened and a plain elm coffin was slowly thrust forth, and laid by two men in fustian along the middle of the vehicle. One of the men then stepped up beside it, took from his pocket a lump of chalk, and wrote upon the cover the name and a few other words in a large, scrawling hand. We believe that they do these things more tenderly now, and provide a plate. He covered the whole with a black cloth, threadbare but decent, the tailboard of the wagon was returned to its place. One of the men handed a certificate of registry to poor grass, and both entered the door, closing it behind them. Their connection with her, short as it had been, was over for ever. Joseph then placed the flowers as enjoined, and the evergreens around the flowers, till it was difficult to divine what the wagon contained. He smacked his whip, and the rather pleasing funeral car crept down the hill and along the road to Weatherbury. 
The afternoon drew on a pace, and looking to the right towards the sea as he walked beside the horse, poor Grass saw strange clouds and scrolls of mist rolling over the long ridges which girt the landscape in that quarter. They came in yet greater volumes, and indolently crept across the intervening valleys, and around the withered papery flags of the moor and river brinks. Then their dank spongy forms closed in upon the sky. It was a sudden overgrowth of atmospheric fungi which had their roots in the neighbouring sea, and by the time that horse, man, and corpse entered Yalbury Great Wood, these silent workings of an invisible hand had reached them, and they were completely enveloped, this being the first arrival of the autumn fogs, and the first fog of the series. The air was as an eye suddenly struck blind. The wagon and its load rolled no longer on the horizontal division between clearness and opacity, but were embedded in an elastic body of a monotonous pallor throughout. There was no perceptible motion in the air, not a visible drop of water fell upon a leaf in the beeches, birches, and firs composing the wood on either side. The trees stood in an attitude of intentness, as if they waited longingly for a wind to come and rock them. A startling quiet overhung all surrounding things so completely that the crunching of the wagon-wheels was as a great noise, and small rustles which had never obtained a hearing except by night were distinctly individualized. Joseph Poorgrass looked round upon his sad burden as it loomed faintly through the flowering laurestines, then at the unfathomable gloom amid the high trees on each hand, indistinct, shadowless, and spectre-like, in their monochrome of grey. He felt anything but cheerful, and wished he had the company of even a child or dog. Stopping the horse, he listened. Not a footstep or wheel was audible anywhere around, and the dead silence was broken only by a heavy particle, falling from a tree through the evergreens and alighting with a smart rap upon the coffin of poor Fanny. The fog had by this time saturated the trees, and this was the first dropping of water from the over-brimming leaves. The hollow echo of its fall reminded the wagoner painfully of the grim leveller. Then hard by came down another drop, then two or three. Presently there was a continual tapping of these heavy drops upon the dead leaves, the road, and the travellers. The nearer boughs were beaded with the mist to the greyness of aged men and the rusty red leaves of the beeches were hung with similar drops, like diamonds on auburn hair. At the roadside hamlet called Roytown, just beyond this wood, was the old inn Buck's Head. It is about a mile and a half from Weatherbury, and in the meridian times of stagecoach travelling had been the place where many coaches changed and kept their relays of horses. All the old stabling was now pulled down and little remained besides the habitable inn itself, which, standing a little way back from the road, signified its existence to people far up and down the highway by a sign hanging from the horizontal bough of an elm on the opposite side of the way. Travellers, for the variety tourists had hardly developed into a distinct species at this state, sometimes said in passing, when they cast their eyes up to the sign-bearing tree, that artists were fond of representing the signboard hanging thus, but that they themselves had never before noticed so perfect an instance in actual working order. It was near this tree that the wagon was standing, into which Gabriel Oak crept on his first journey to Weatherbury, but owing to the darkness the sign and the inn had been unobserved. The manners of the inn were of the old established type. Indeed, in the minds of its frequenters they existed as unalterable formulae. Example. Wrap with the bottom of your pint for more liquor. For tobacco, shout. In calling for the girl in waiting, say, maid. Ditto for the landlady, old soul, etc., etc. It was a relief to Joseph's heart when the friendly signboard came in view, and stopping his horse immediately beneath it, he proceeded to fulfil an intention made a long time before. His spirits were oozing out of him quite. He turned the horse's head to the green bank, and entered the hostel for a mug of ale. 
going down into the kitchen of the inn, the floor of which was a step below the passage, which in its turn was a step below the road outside, what should Joseph see to gladden his eyes but two copper-coloured discs, in the form of the countenances of Mr. Jan Coggan and Mr. Mark Clark? These owners of the two most appreciative throats in the neighbourhood, within the pale of respectability, were now sitting face to face over a three-legged circular table, having an iron rim to keep the cups and pots from being accidentally elbowed off. They might have been said to resemble the setting sun and the full moon shining vis-a-vis -vis across the globe. "'Why, tis neighbour poor grass," said Mark Clark. "'I'm sure your face don't praise your mistress's table, Joseph.' "'We had a very pale companion for the last four miles,' said Joseph, indulging in a shudder toned down by resignation. "'And to speak the truth, twas beginning to tell upon me. I assure you I hadn't seen the colour of victuals or drink since breakfast-time this morning, and that was no more than a due bit of field.' "'Then drink, Joseph, and don't restrain yourself,' said Coggan, handing him a hooped mug three-quarters full. Joseph drank for a moderately long time, then for a longer time, saying as he lowered the jug, "'Tis pretty drinkin', very pretty drinkin', and is more than cheerful on my melancholy errand, so to speak it." "'True. Drink is a pleasant delight,' said Jan, as one who repeated a truism so familiar to his brain that he hardly noticed his passage over his tongue, and, lifting the cup, Coggan tilted his head gradually backwards, with eyes closed, that his expectant soul might not be diverted for one instant from its bliss by irrelevant surroundings. "'Well, I must be on again,' said poor Grass. "'Not but I should like another nip with ye, but the parish might lose confidence in me if I was seed here.' "'Where you be trade not to today, then, Joseph?' "'Back to Weatherbury.' I got poor little Fanny Robin in my wagon outside, and I must be at the churchyard gates at a quarter to five with her. Ah, I've heard of her, and so she's nailed up in parish boards after all, and nobody to pay the bell shilling and the grave half-crown. The parish pays the grave half-crown, but not the bell shilling, because the bell's a luxury, but I can't hardly do without the grave, poor body. However, I expect our mistress will pay all. A pretty maid as ever I see. But what's your hurry, Joseph? The poor woman's dead, and you can't bring her back to life, and you may as well sit down comfortable and finish another with us. I don't mind taking just the least timberful you can dream of more with ye sonnies, but only a few minutes, cos tis as it is. Of course you'll have another drop. A man's twice the man afterwards. You feel so warm and glorious and you whop and slap at your work without any trouble, and everything goes on like sticks a-breaking. Too much liquor is bad, and leads us to that horned man in the smoky house. But after all, many people have the gift of enjoying a wet, and since we be highly favoured with a power that way, we should make the most of it. True, said Mark Clark, to that talent the Lord has mercifully bestowed upon us, and we ought not to neglect it. But what with the parsons and the clerks and school people and serious tea parties, the merry old ways of good life have gone to the dogs, upon my carcass they have. Well, really, I must be onward again now, said Joseph. Now, now, Joseph, nonsense. The poor woman is dead, isn't she? And what's your hurry? Well, I hope Providence won't be in a way with me for my doings, said Joseph, sitting down again. I've been troubled with weak moments lately, tis true. I've been drinky once this month already, and I did not go to church a Sunday, and I dropped a course or two yesterday, so I don't want to go too far from my safety. Your next world is your next world, and not to be squandered off-hand. I believe you to be a chapel member, Joseph, that I do. Oh, no, no, I don't go so far as that. For my part said Coggan. I'm staunch Church of England. Aye, and fate so be I, said Mark Clark. I won't say much for myself. I don't wish to, Coggan continued, with that tendency to talk on principles which is characteristic of the barleycorn. But I've never changed a single doctrine. I've stuck like a plaster to the old faith I was born in. 
Yes, there's this to be said for the church. A man can belong to the church and bide in his cheerful old inn, and never trouble or worry his mind about doctrines at all. But to be a meetinger, you must go to chapel in all winds and weathers, and make yourself as frantic as a skit. Not but that chapel members be clever chaps enough in their way. They can lift up beautiful prayers out of their own heads, all about their families and shipwrecks in the newspaper. They can, they can, said Mark Clark with corroborative feeling. But we churchmen, you see, must have it all printed aforehand, or dang it all, we should no more know what to say to a great gaffer like the Lord than babes unborn. Chapel folk be more hand and glove with them above than we, said Joseph thoughtfully. Yes, said Coggan. We know very well that if anybody do go to heaven, they will. They've worked hard for it, and they deserve to have it, such as tis. I bain't such a fool as to pretend that we who stick to the church have the same chance as they, because we know we have not. But I hate a feller who'll change his old ancient doctrines for the sake of getting to heaven. I'd as soon turn king's evidence for the few pounds you get. Why, neighbours, when every one of my taties were frosted, our parson thirdly were the man who gave me a sack for seed, though he hardly had one for his own use, and no money to buy him. If it hadn't been for him, I shouldn't have had a tatey to put in my garden. Do you think I'd turn after that? No, I'll stick to my side, and if we be in the wrong, so be it. I'll fall with the fallen. Well said, very well said, observed Joseph. However, folks, I must be moving on now, upon my life I must. Parson Turley be waiting at the church gates, and there's a woman abiding outside in the wagon. Joseph Poorgrass, don't be so miserable. Parson Turley won't mind. He's a generous man. He's found me in tracts for years, and I've consumed a good many in the course of a long and shady life, but he's never been the man to cry out at the expense. Sit down. The longer Joseph Poorgrass remained, the less his spirit was troubled by the duties which devolved upon him this afternoon. The minutes glided by uncounted, until the evening shades began perceptibly to deepen, and the eyes of the tree were but sparkling points on the surface of darkness. Coggan's repeater struck six from his pocket, in the usual still, small tones. At that moment hasty steps were heard in the entry, and the door opened to admit the figure of Gabriel Oak, followed by the maid of the inn bearing a candle. He stared sternly at the one lengthy and two round faces of the sitters, which confronted him with the expressions of a fiddle and a couple of warming pans. Joseph Poorgrass blinked and shrank several inches into the background. "'Upon my soul I'm ashamed of you. Tis disgraceful, Joseph, disgraceful!' said Gabriel indignantly. Coggan, call yourself a man, and don't know better than this. Coggan looked up indefinitely at Oak, one or other of his eyes occasionally opening and closing of its own accord, as if it were not a member, but a dozy individual with a distinct personality. Don't take on so, Shepherd, said Mark Clark, looking reproachfully at the candle, which appeared to possess special features of interest for his eyes. "'Nobody can hurt a dead woman,' at length said Coggan, with the precision of a machine. "'All that could be done for her is done. She's beyond us. And why should a man put himself in a tearing hurry for lifeless clay that can neither feel nor see, and don't know what you do with her at all? If she'd been alive, I would have been the first to help her. If she now wanted victuals and drinks, I'd pay for it, money down. But she's dead, and no speed of ours will bring her to life.' The woman's past us, time spent upon her is throwed away. Why should we hurry to do what's not required? Drink, Shepherd, and be friends, for tomorrow we may be like her. We may, added Mark Clark emphatically, at once drinking himself, to run no further risk of losing his chance by the event alluded to, Jan, meanwhile, merging his additional thoughts of tomorrow in a song. Tomorrow, tomorrow. And while peace and plenty I find at my board, With a heart free from sickness and sorrow, With my friends I will share what today may afford, And let them spread the table tomorrow, Tomorrow, tomorrow. Do hold thy horning, Jan, said Oak, 
and turning upon poor grass. As for you, Joseph, who do your wicked deeds in such confoundedly holy ways, you are as drunk as you can stand. No, Shepherd Oak, no. Listen to reason, Shepherd. All that's the matter with me is the affliction called a multiplying eye. And that's how it is I look double to you. I mean, you look double to me. A multiplying eye is a very bad thing, said Mark Clark. It always comes on when I've been in a public house a little time, said Joseph Poorgrass meekly. Yes, I see two of every sort, as if I were some holy man living in the times of King Noah and entering to the ark. Yes, he added, becoming much affected by the picture of himself as a person thrown away and shedding tears. I feel too good for England. I ought to have lived in Genesis by right, like the other men of sacrifice, and then I shouldn't have been called a, a drunkard in such a way. I wish you'd show yourself a man of spirit, and not sit whining there. Show myself a man of spirit? Ah, well, let me take the name of drunkard humbly, and let me be a man of contrite knees, let it be. I know that I do always say, please God, afore I do anything, from my getting up to my going down are the same, and I'd be willing to take as much disgrace as there is in that holy act. Ha, ah, yes, but not a man of spirit. Have I ever allowed a toe of pride to be lifted against my hinder parts without groaning manfully that I question the right to do so? I inquire that query boldly. We can't say that you have, hero poor grass admitted Jan. Never have I allowed such treatment to pass unquestioned, yet the shepherd says in the face of that rich testimony that I be not a man of spirit. Well, let it pass by, and death is a kind friend. Gabriel, seeing that neither of the three was in a fit state to take charge of the wagon for the remainder of the journey, made no reply, but, closing the door again upon them, went across to where the vehicle stood now getting indistinct in the fog and gloom of this mildewy time he pulled the horse's head from the large patch of turf it had eaten bare readjusted the boughs over the coffin and drove along through the unwholesome night it had gradually become rumoured in the village that the body to be brought and buried that day was all that was left of the unfortunate fanny robin who had followed the eleventh from casterbridge through melchester and onwards but, thanks to Boldwood's reticence and Oak's generosity, the lover she had followed had never been individualised as Troy. Gabriel hoped that the whole truth of the matter might not be published, till at any rate the girl had been in her grave for a few days, when the interposing barriers of earth and time, and a sense that the events had been somewhat shut into oblivion, would deaden the sting that revelation and invidious remark would have for Bathsheba just now. By the time that Gabriel reached the old manor-house, her residence, which lay in his way to the church, it was quite dark. A man came from the gate and said through the fog, which hung between them like blown flour, "'Is that poor grass with the corpse?' Gabriel recognised the voice as that of the parson. "'The corpse is here, sir,' said Gabriel. "'I have just been to inquire of Mrs. Troy if she could tell me the reason for the delay.' I am afraid it is too late now for the funeral to be performed with proper decency. Have you the registrar's certificate? No, said Gabriel. I expect Poorgrass has that, and he's at the book's head. I forgot to ask him for it. Then that settles the matter. We'll put off the funeral till tomorrow morning. The body may be brought on to the church, or it may be left here at the farm, and fetched by the bearers in the morning. They waited more than an hour, and have now gone home. Gabriel had his reasons for thinking the latter a most objectionable plan, notwithstanding that Fanny had been an inmate of the farmhouse for several years in the lifetime of Bathsheba's uncle. Visions of several unhappy contingencies which might arise from this delay flitted before him. But his will was not law, and he went indoors to inquire of his mistress what were her wishes on the subject. He found her in an unusual mood. Her eyes, as she looked up to him, were suspicious and perplexed, as with some antecedent thought. Troy had not yet returned. At first Bathsheba assented with a mien of indifference to his proposition that they should go on to the church at once with their burden, but immediately afterwards, following Gabriel to the gate, 
she swerved to the extreme of solicitousness on Fanny's account, and desired that the girl might be brought into the house. Oak argued upon the convenience of leaving her in the wagon, just as she lay now with her flowers and green leaves about her, merely wheeling the vehicle into the coach-house till the morning, but to no purpose. It is unkind and unchristian, she said, to leave the poor thing in the coach-house all night. Very well, then, said the parson, and I will arrange that the funeral shall take place early to-morrow. Perhaps Mrs. Troy is right in feeling that we cannot treat a dead fellow creature too thoughtfully. We must remember that though she may have erred grievously in leaving her home, she is still our sister, and it is to be believed that God's uncovenanted mercies are extended towards her, and that she is a member of the flock of Christ. The parson's words spread into the heavy air with a sad yet unperturbed cadence, and Gabriel shed an honest tear. Bathsheba seemed unmoved. Mr. Thirdly then left them, and Gabriel lighted a lantern. Fetching three other men to assist him, they bore the unconscious truant indoors, placing the coffin on two benches in the middle of the little sitting-room next the hall, as Bathsheba directed. Everyone except Gabriel Oak then left the room. He still indecisively lingered beside the body. He was deeply troubled at the wretchedly ironical aspect that circumstances were putting on with regard to Troy's wife, and at his own powerlessness to counteract them. In spite of his careful manoeuvring all this day, the very worst event that could in any way have happened in connection with the burial had happened now. Oak imagined the terrible discovery resulting from this afternoon's work that might cast over Bathsheba's life a shade which the interposition of many lapsing years might but indifferently lighten, and which nothing at all might altogether remove. Suddenly, as in a last attempt to save Bathsheba from, at any rate, immediate anguish, he looked again, as he had looked before, at the chalk writing upon the coffin lid. The scrawl was this simple one. Fanny Robin and Child. Gabriel took his handkerchief, and carefully rubbed out the two latter words, leaving visible the inscription, Fanny Robin only. He then left the room and went out quietly by the front door. End of chapter 42 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 43 Fanny's Revenge "'Do you want me any longer, ma'am?' inquired Liddy, at a later hour that same evening, standing by the door with a chamber candlestick in her hand, and addressing Bathsheba, who sat cheerless and alone in the large parlour beside the first fire of the season. "'No more to-night, Liddy.' "'I'll sit up for master, if you like, ma'am. I'm not at all afraid of Fanny, if I may sit in my own room and have a candle.' She was such a childlike, nesh young thing that her spirit couldn't appear to anybody if it tried, I'm quite sure. Oh, no, no, you go to bed. I'll sit up for him myself till twelve o'clock, and if he has not arrived by that time, I shall give him up and go to bed too. It's half past ten now. Oh, is it? Why don't you sit upstairs, ma'am? Why don't I? said Bathsheba, desultorily. It isn't worth while. "'There's a fire here, Liddy.' She suddenly exclaimed in an impulsive and excited whisper, "'Have you heard anything strange said of Fanny?' The words had no sooner escaped her than an expression of unutterable regret crossed her face, and she burst into tears. "'No, not a word,' said Liddy, looking at the weeping woman with astonishment. "'What is it makes you cry so, ma'am? Has anything hurt you?' She came to Bathsheba's side, with a face full of sympathy. "'No, Liddy, I don't want you any more. I can hardly say why I have taken to crying lately. I never used to cry. Good night.' Liddy then left the parlour and closed the door. Bathsheba was lonely and miserable now, not lonelier actually than she had been before her marriage, but her loneliness then was to that of the present time, as the solitude of a mountain is to the solitude of a cave. And within the last day or two had come these disquieting thoughts about her husband's past. Her wayward sentiment that evening concerning Fanny's temporary resting-place had been the result of a strange complication of impulses in Bathsheba's bosom. 
Perhaps it would be more accurately described as a determined rebellion against her prejudices, a revulsion from a lower instinct of uncharitableness, which would have withheld all sympathy from the dead woman, because in life she had preceded Bathsheba in the attentions of a man whom Bathsheba had by no means ceased from loving, though her love was sick to death just now with the gravity of a further misgiving. In five or ten minutes there was another tap at the door. Liddy reappeared, and coming in a little way, stood hesitating, until at length she said, "'Mary Ann has just heard something very strange, but I know it isn't true, and we shall be sure to know the rights of it in a day or two. "'What is it?' "'Oh, nothing connected with you or us, ma'am. It's about Fanny, the same thing that you have heard.' "'I have heard nothing.' I mean that a wicked story has got to Weatherbury within this last hour, that Liddy came close to her mistress and whispered the remainder of the sentence slowly into her ear, inclining her head as she spoke in the direction of the room where Fanny lay. Bathsheba trembled from head to foot. "'I don't believe it,' she said excitedly. "'And there's only one name written on the coffin cover.' "'Nor I, ma'am.' and a good many others don't, for we should surely have been told more about it if it had been true. Don't you think so, ma'am? We might, we might not. Bathsheba turned and looked into the fire, that Liddy might not see her face. Finding that her mistress was going to say no more, Liddy glided out, closed the door softly, and went to bed. Bathsheba's face, as she continued looking into the fire that evening, might have excited solicitousness on her account even among those who loved her least. The sadness of Fanny Robin's fate did not make Bathsheba's glorious, although she was the Esther to this poor Vashti, and their fates might be supposed to stand in some respects as contrasts to each other. When Liddy came into the room a second time, the beautiful eyes which met hers had worn a listless, weary look and when she went out after telling the story, they had expressed wretchedness in full activity. Her simple country nature, fed on old-fashioned principles, was troubled by that which would have troubled a woman of the world very little, both Fanny and her child, if she had one, being dead. Bathsheba had grounds for conjecturing a connection between her own history and the dimly suspected tragedy of Fanny's end, which Oak and Boldwood never for a moment credited her, with possessing. The meeting with the lonely woman on the previous Saturday night had been unwitnessed and unspoken of. Oak may have had the best of intentions in withholding for as many days as possible the details of what had happened to Fanny, but had he known that Bathsheba's perceptions had already been exercised in the matter, he would have done nothing to lengthen the minutes of suspense she was now undergoing, when the certainty which must terminate it would be the worst fact suspected after all. She suddenly felt a longing desire to speak to someone stronger than herself, and so get strength to sustain her surmised position with dignity and her lurking doubts with stoicism. Where could she find such a friend? Nowhere in the house. She was by far the coolest of the women under her roof. Patience and suspension of judgment for a few hours were what she wanted to learn, and there was nobody to teach her. Might she but go to Gabriel Oak? But that could not be. What a way Oak had, she thought, of enduring things. Boldwood, who seemed so much deeper and higher and stronger in feeling than Gabriel, had not yet learnt, any more than she herself, the simple lesson which Oak showed a mastery of by every turn and look he gave, that among the multitude of interests by which he was surrounded, those which affected his personal well-being were not the most absorbing and important in his eyes. Oak meditatively looked upon the horizon of the circumstances, without any special regard to his own standpoint in the midst. That was how she would wish to be. But then Oak was not racked with incertitude upon the inmost matter of his bosom, as she was at this moment. Oak knew all about Fanny that he wished to know. She felt convinced of that. If she were to go to him, now at once, and say no more than these few words— what is the truth of the story? He would feel bound in honour to tell her. It would be an inexpressible relief. No further speech would need to be uttered. He knew her so well that no eccentricity of behaviour in her would alarm him. She flung a cloak round her, went to the door and opened it. Every blade, every twig was still. 
The air was yet thick with moisture, though somewhat less dense than during the afternoon, and a steady smack of drops upon the fallen leaves under the boughs was almost musical in its soothing regularity. It seemed better to be out of the house than within it, and Bathsheba closed the door, and walked slowly down the lane till she came opposite to Gabriel's cottage, where he now lived alone, having left Coggan's house through being pinched for room. There was a light in one window only, and that was downstairs. The shutters were not closed, nor was any blind or curtain drawn over the window, neither robbery nor observation being a contingency which could do much injury to the occupant of the domicile. Yes, it was Gabriel himself who was sitting up. He was reading. From her standing place on the road she could see him plainly, sitting quite still, his light curly head upon his hand, and only occasionally looking up to snuff the candle which stood beside him. At length he looked at the clock, seemed surprised at the lateness of the hour, closed his book and arose. He was going to bed, she knew, and if she tapped it must be done at once. Alas for her resolve! She felt she could not do it. Not for worlds now could she give a hint about her misery to him, much less ask him plainly for information on the cause of Fanny's death. She must suspect and guess and chafe and bear it all alone. Like a homeless wanderer she lingered by the bank, as if lulled and fascinated by the atmosphere of content which seemed to spread from that little dwelling, and was so sadly lacking in her own. Gabriel appeared in an upper room, placed his light in the window-bench, and then knelt down to pray. The contrast of the picture with her rebellious and agitated existence at this time was too much for her to bear to look upon longer. It was not for her to make a truce with trouble by any such means. She must tread her giddy, distracting measure to its last note, as she had begun it. With a swollen heart she went again up the lane and entered her own door. More fevered now by a reaction from the first feeling which Oak's example had raised in her, she paused in the hall, looking at the door of the room wherein Fanny lay. She locked her fingers, threw back her head, and strained her hot hands rigidly across her forehead, saying, with a hysterical sob, "'Would to God you would speak to me and tell me your secret, Fanny! Oh, I hope it is not true that there are two of you. If I could only look upon you for one minute, I should know all.' A few moments passed, and she added slowly, "'And I will!' Bathsheba in after times could never gauge the mood which carried her through the actions following this murmured resolution on this memorable evening of her life. She went to the lumber closet for a screwdriver. At the end of a short, though undefined, time she found herself in the small room, quivering with emotion, a mist before her eyes, and an excruciating pulsation in her brain, standing beside the uncovered coffin of the girl whose conjectured end had so entirely engrossed her and saying to herself, in a husky voice, as she gazed within, "'It was best to know the worst, and I know it now.' She was conscious of having brought about this situation by a series of actions, done as by one in an extravagant dream, of following that idea as to method, which had burst upon her in the hall with glaring obviousness, by gliding to the top of the stairs, assuring herself by listening to the heavy breathing of her maids that they were asleep, gliding down again, turning the handle of the door within which the young girl lay, and deliberately setting herself to do what, if she had anticipated any such undertaking at night and alone, would have horrified her, but which, when done, was not so dreadful as was the conclusive proof of her husband's conduct, which came with knowing beyond doubt the last chapter of Fanny's story. Bathsheba's head sank upon her bosom and a breath which had been bated in suspense, curiosity and interest, was exhaled now in the form of a whispered wail. Oh! she said, and the silent room added length to her moan. Her tears fell fast beside the unconscious pair in the coffin, tears of a complicated origin, of a nature indescribable, almost indefinable except as other than those of simple sorrow. Assuredly, their wanted fires must have lived in Fanny's ashes when events were so shaped as to chariot her hither in this natural, unobtrusive, yet effectual manner. The one feat alone, that of dying, by which a mean condition could be resolved into a grand one, Fanny had achieved. And to that had destiny subjoined this rencounter to-night, 
which had in Bathsheba's wild imagining turned her companion's failure to success, her humiliation to triumph, her lucklessness to ascendancy. It had thrown over herself a garish light of mockery, and set upon all things about her an ironical smile. Fanny's face was framed in by that yellow hair of hers, and there was no longer much room for doubt as to the origin of the curl owned by Troy. In Bathsheba's heated fancy the innocent white countenance expressed a dim, triumphant consciousness of the pain she was retaliating for her pain with all the merciless rigour of the Mosaic law. Burning for burning, wound for wound, strife for strife. Bathsheba indulged in contemplations of escape from her position by immediate death, which, thought she, though it was an inconvenient and awful way, had limits to its inconvenience and awfulness that could not be overpassed, whilst the shames of life were measureless. Yet even this scheme of extinction by death was but tamely copying her rival's method, without the reasons which had glorified it in her rival's case. She glided rapidly up and down the room, as was mostly her habit when excited, her hands hanging clasped in front of her as she thought, and in part expressed in broken words. Oh, I hate her, yet I don't mean that I hate her, for it is grievous and wicked, and yet I hate her a little. Yes, my flesh insists upon hating her, whether my spirit is willing or no. If she had only lived, I could have been angry and cruel towards her with some justification, but to be vindictive towards a poor dead woman recoils upon myself. Oh, God, have mercy! I am miserable at all this. Bathsheba became at this moment so terrified at her own state of mind that she looked round for some sort of refuge from herself. The vision of Oak kneeling down that night recurred to her, and with the imitative instinct which animates women she seized upon the idea, resolved to kneel and, if possible, pray. Gabriel had prayed, so would she. She knelt beside the coffin covered her face with her hands, and for a time the room was silent as a tomb. Whether from a purely mechanical, or from any other cause, when Bathsheba arose it was with a quieted spirit, and a regret for the antagonistic instincts which had seized upon her just before. In her desire to make atonement she took flowers from a vase by the window, and began laying them around the dead girl's head. Bathsheba knew no other way of showing kindness to persons departed than by giving them flowers. She knew not how long she remained engaged thus. She forgot time, life, where she was, what she was doing. The slamming together of the coach-house doors in the yard brought her to herself again. An instant after, the front door opened and closed. Steps crossed the hall, and her husband appeared at the entrance to the room, looking in upon her. He beheld it all by degrees, stared in stupefaction at the scene, as if he thought it an illusion raised by some fiendish incantation. Bathsheba, pallid as a corpse on end, gazed back at him in the same wild way. So little her instinctive guesses the fruit of a legitimate induction that at this moment, as he stood with the door in his hand, Troy never once thought of Fanny in connection with what he saw. His first confused idea was that somebody in the house had died. "'Well, what?' said Troy blankly. "'I must go. I must go,' said Bathsheba to herself more than to him. She came with a dilated eye towards the door to push past him. "'What's the matter, in God's name? Who's dead?' said Troy. "'I cannot say. Let me out. I want air,' she continued." "'But no, stay, I insist.' He seized her hand, and then volition seemed to leave her, and she went off into a state of passivity. He, still holding her, came up the room, and thus, hand in hand, Troy and Bathsheba approached the coffin's side. The candle was standing on a bureau close by them, and the light slanted down, distinctly enkindling the cold features of both mother and babe. Troy looked in, dropped his wife's hand. Knowledge of it all came over him in a lurid sheen, and he stood still. So still he remained that he could be imagined to have left in him no motive power whatever. The clashes of feelings in all directions confounded one another, produced a neutrality, and there was motion in none. "'Do you know her?' said Bathsheba, in a small enclosed echo, as from the interior of a cell. "'I do,' said Troy. "'Is it she?' 
it is. He had originally stood perfectly erect, and now, in the well-nigh congealed immobility of his frame, could be discerned an incipient movement, as in the darkest night may be discerned light after a while. He was gradually sinking forwards. The lines of his features softened, and dismay modulated to illimitable sadness. Bathsheba was regarding him from the other side, still with parted lips and distracted eyes. Capacity for intense feeling is proportionate to the general intensity of the nature, and perhaps in all Fanny's sufferings, much greater relatively to her strength, there was never a time when she suffered in an absolute sense what Bathsheba suffered now. What Troy did was to sink upon his knees with an indefinable union of remorse and reverence in his face, and, bending over Fanny Robin, gently kissed her, as one would kiss an infant asleep to avoid awakening it. At the sight and sound of that, to her, unendurable act, Bathsheba sprang towards him. All the strong feeling which had been scattered over her existence, since she knew what feeling was, seemed gathered together in one pulsation now. The revulsion from her indignant mood a little earlier, when she had meditated upon compromised honour, forestalment, eclipse in maternity by another, was violent and entire. All that was forgotten in the simple and still strong attachment to wife and husband. She had sighed for her self-completeness then, and now she cried aloud against the severance of the union she had deplored. She flung her arms round Troy's neck, exclaiming wildly from the deepest deep of her heart, "'Don't! Don't kiss them! Oh, Frank, I can't bear it! I can't! I love you better than she did! Kiss me too, Frank! Kiss me! Will you, Frank, kiss me too?' There was something so abnormal and startling in the childlike pain and simplicity of this appeal from a woman of Bathsheba's calibre and independence, that Troy, loosening her tightly clasped arms from his neck, looked at her in bewilderment. It was such an unexpected revelation of all women being alike at heart, even those so different in their accessories as Fanny and this one beside him, that Troy could hardly seem to believe her to be his proud wife Bathsheba. Fanny's own spirit seemed to be animating her frame, but this was the mood of a few instants only. When the momentary surprise had passed, his expression changed to a silencing and imperious gaze. "'I will not kiss you,' he said, pushing her away. Had the wife now but gone no further, yet, perhaps, under the harrowing circumstances, to speak out was the one wrong act which can be better understood, if not forgiven in her, than the right and politic one her rival being now but a corpse. All the feeling she had betrayed into showing she drew back to herself again by a strenuous effort of self-command. "'What have you to say as your reason?' she asked, her bitter voice being strangely low, quite that of another woman now. "'I have to say that I have been a bad, black-hearted man,' he answered. "'And that this woman is your victim, and I not less than she?' "'Ah!' Don't taunt me, madam. This woman is more to me, dead as she is, than ever you were, or are, or can be. If Satan had not tempted me with that face of yours and those cursed coquetteries, I should have married her. I never had another thought till you came in my way. Would to God that I had, but it is all too late. He turned to Fanny then. But never mind, darling, he said. In the sight of heaven you are my very, very wife. At these words there arose from Bathsheba's lips a long, low cry of measureless despair and indignation, such a wail of anguish as had never before been heard within those old inhabited walls. It was the terri liori of her union with Troy. "'If she is that, what am I?' she added, as a continuation of the same cry, and sobbing pitifully and the rarity with her of such abandonment only made the condition more dire. "'You are nothing to me, nothing,' said Troy heartlessly. "'A ceremony before a priest doesn't make a marriage. I am not morally yours.' A vehement impulse to flee from him, to run from this place, hide and escape his words at any price, not stopping short of death itself, mastered Bathsheba now. She waited not an instant, but turned to the door and ran out. End of chapter 43 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 44 Under a Tree Reaction 
Bathsheba went along the dark road, neither knowing nor caring about the direction or issue of her flight. The first time that she definitely noticed her position was when she reached a gate leading into a thicket, overhung by some large oak and beech trees. On looking into the place, it occurred to her that she had seen it by daylight on some previous occasion, and that what appeared like an impassable thicket was in reality a break of fern, now withering fast. She could think of nothing better to do with her palpitating self than to go in there and hide, and entering she lighted on a spot sheltered from the damp fog by a reclining trunk, where she sank down upon a tangled couch of fronds and stems. She mechanically pulled some armfuls round her to keep off the breezes, and closed her eyes. Whether she slept or not that night, Bathsheba was not clearly aware. But it was with a freshened existence and a cooler brain that a long time afterwards she became conscious of some interesting proceedings which were going on in the trees above her head and around. A coarse-throated chatter was the first sound. It was a sparrow, just waking. Next, chee wee 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 wees from another retreat. It was a finch. Third, tink-tink-tink-tink-a-chink from the hedge. It was a robin. Chuck, 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 overhead, a squirrel. Then, from the road, with my rat-ta-ta and my rum-tum-tum. It was a ploughboy. Presently he came opposite, and she believed from his voice that he was one of the boys on her own farm. He was followed by a shambling tramp of heavy feet, and looking through the ferns, Bathsheba could just discern in the wan light of daybreak a team of her own horses. They stopped to drink at a pond on the other side of the way. She watched them flouncing into the pool, drinking, tossing up their heads, drinking again, the water dribbling from their lips in silver threads. There was another flounce, and they came out of the pond and turned back again towards the farm. She looked further around. Day was just dawning, and beside its cool air and colours, her heated actions and resolves of the night stood out in a lurid contrast. She perceived that in her lap and clinging to her hair were red and yellow leaves which had come down from the tree and settled silently upon her during her partial sleep. Bathsheba shook her dress to get rid of them when multitudes of the same family lying around about her rose and fluttered away in the breeze thus created, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. There was an opening towards the east, and the glow from the as yet unrisen sun attracted her eyes thither. From her feet, and between the beautiful yellowing ferns with their feathery arms, the ground sloped downwards to a hollow, in which was a species of swamp dotted with fungi. A morning mist hung over it now, a fulsome yet magnificent silvery veil, full of light from the sun, yet semi-opaque, the hedge behind it being in some measure hidden by its hazy luminousness. Up the sides of this depression grew sheaves of the common rush, and here and there a peculiar species of flag, the blades of which glistened in the emerging sun like sides. But the general aspect of the swamp was malignant. From its moist and poisonous coat seemed to be exhaled the essences of evil things in the earth, and in the waters under the earth. The fungi grew in all manner of positions from rotting leaves and tree stumps, some exhibiting to her listless gaze their clammy tops, others oozing gills. Some were marked with great splotches, red as arterial blood. Others were saffron yellow, and others tall and attenuated with stems like macaroni. Some were leathery and of richest browns. The hollow seemed a nursery of pestilence, small and great, in the immediate neighbourhood of comfort and health, and Bathsheba arose with a tremor at the thought of having passed the night on the brink of so dismal a place. There were now other footsteps to be heard along the road. Bathsheba's nerves were still unstrung. She crouched down out of sight again, and the pedestrian came into view. He was a schoolboy, with a bag slung over his shoulder containing his dinner, and a book in his hand. He paused by the gate, and, without looking up, continued murmuring words in tones quite loud enough to reach her ears. "'O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord! That I knows out a book. Give us, give us, give us, give us, give us! That I know. Grace that, grace that, grace that, grace that. That I know.' Other words followed to the same effect. The boy was of the dunce class, apparently. The book was a psalter 
and this was his way of learning the collect. In the worst attacks of trouble there appears to be always a superficial film of consciousness which is left disengaged and open to the notice of trifles, and Bathsheba was faintly amused at the boy's method, till he too passed on. By this time stupor had given place to anxiety, and anxiety began to make room for hunger and thirst. A form now appeared on the rise on the other side of the swamp, half hidden by the mist, and came towards Bathsheba. The woman, for it was a woman, approached with her face askance, as if looking earnestly on all sides of her. When she got a little further round to the left, and drew nearer, Bathsheba could see the newcomer's profile against the sunny sky, and knew the wavy sweep from forehead to chin, with neither angle nor decisive line anywhere about it, to be the familiar contour of Lily Smallbury. Bathsheba's heart bounded with gratitude at the thought that she was not altogether deserted, and she jumped up. "'Oh, Liddy!' she said, or attempted to say, but the words had only been framed by her lips. There came no sound. She had lost her voice by exposure to the clogged atmosphere all these hours of night. "'Oh, ma'am, I'm so glad I have found you,' said the girl, as soon as she saw Bathsheba. "'You can't come across!' Bathsheba said in a whisper, which she vainly endeavoured to make loud enough to reach Liddy's ears. Liddy, not knowing this, stepped down upon the swamp, saying as she did so, "'It will bear me up, I think.' Bathsheba never forgot that transient little picture of Liddy crossing the swamp to her there in the morning light. Iridescent bubbles of dank subterranean breath rose from the sweating sod beside the waiting-maid's feet as she trod, hissing as they burst and expanded away to join the vapory firmament above. Liddy did not sink as Bathsheba had anticipated. She landed safely on the other side, and looked up at the beautiful, though pale and weary face of her young mistress. "'Poor thing,' said Liddy, with tears in her eyes. "'Do hearten yourself up a little, ma'am. However did—' "'I can't speak above a whisper. My voice is gone for the present,' said Bathsheba hurriedly. I suppose the damp air from that hollow has taken it away. Liddy, don't question me, mind. Who sent you? Anybody? Nobody. I thought when I found you were not at home that something cruel had happened. I fancy I heard his voice late last night, and so, knowing something was wrong... Is he at home? No. He left just before I came out. Is Fanny taken away? Not yet. She soon will be. At nine o'clock. We won't go home at present, then. Suppose we walk about in this wood. Liddy, without exactly understanding everything, or anything, in this episode, assented, and they walked together further among the trees. But you had better come in, ma'am, and have something to eat. You will die of a chill. I shall not come indoors yet. Perhaps never. Shall I get you something to eat, and something else to put over your head besides that little shawl? "'If you will, Liddy.' Liddy vanished, and at the end of twenty minutes returned with a cloak, hat, some slices of bread and butter, a teacup, and some hot tea in a little china jug. "'Is Fanny gone?' said Bathsheba. "'No,' said her companion, pouring out the tea. Bathsheba wrapped herself up and ate and drank sparingly. Her voice was then a little clearer, and trifling colour returned to her face. "'Now we'll walk about again,' she said. They wandered about the wood for nearly two hours, Bathsheba replying in monosyllables to Liddy's prattle, for her mind ran on one subject, and one only. She interrupted with, "'I wonder if Fanny is gone by this time.' "'I will go and see.' She came back with the information that the men were just taking away the corpse, that Bathsheba had been inquired for that she had replied to the effect that her mistress was unwell and could not be seen. "'Then they think I am in my bedroom?' "'Yes.' Liddy then ventured to add, "'You said when I first found you that you might never go home again. You didn't mean it, ma'am.' "'No, I've altered my mind. It is only women with no pride in them who run away from their husbands. There is one position worse than that of being found dead in your husband's house from his ill-usage, and that is, to be found alive through having gone away to the house of somebody else. I've thought about it all this morning, and I've chosen my course. 
A runaway wife is an encumbrance to everybody, and a burden to herself, and a byword, all of which make up a heap of misery greater than any that comes by staying at home, though this may include the trifling items of insult, beating, and starvation. Liddy, if ever you marry, God forbid that you ever should, you'll find yourself in a fearful situation. But mind this, don't you flinch, stand your ground, and be cut to pieces. That's what I am going to do. "'Oh, mistress, don't talk so,' said Liddy, taking her hand. "'But I knew you had too much sense to bide away. "'May I ask what dreadful thing has happened between you and him?' "'You may ask, but I may not tell.' In about ten minutes they returned to the house by a circuitous route, entering at the rear. Bathsheba glided up the back stairs to a disused attic, and her companion followed. "'Liddy!' she said with a lighter heart, for youth and hope had begun to reassert themselves. "'You are to be my confidant, for the present. Somebody must be, and I choose you. Well, I shall take up my abode here for a while. Will you get a fire lighted, put down a piece of carpet, and help me make the place comfortable? Afterwards I want you and Mary Ann to bring up that little stump bedstead in the small room, and the bed belonging to it, and a table and some other things. What shall I do to pass the heavy time away?' "'Any handkerchiefs is a very good thing,' said Liddy. "'Oh, no, no, I hate needlework. I always did.' "'Knitting. And that, too. "'You might finish your sampler, for only carnations and peacocks want filling in, "'and then it could be framed and glazed and hung beside your aunt's, ma'am. "'The samplers are out of date, horribly countrified. "'No, Liddy, I'll read. Bring up some books, not new ones. "'I haven't the heart to read anything new.' "'Some of your uncle's old ones, ma'am?' "'Yes, some of those we stowed away in boxes.' A faint gleam of humour passed over her face as she said, "'Bring Beaumont and Fletcher's Maid's Tragedy, and The Morning Bride, and, let me see, Night Thoughts, and The Vanity of Human Wishes. "'And that story of the black man who murdered his wife Desdemona. "'It's a nice dismal one that would suit you excellent just now.' "'Now, Liddy, you've been looking into my books without telling me, and I said you were not to. How do you know it would suit me? It wouldn't suit me at all.' "'But if the others do—' "'No, they don't, and I won't read dismal books. Why should I read dismal books, indeed? Bring me Love in a Village, and Maid of the Mill, and Dr. Syntax, and some volumes of The Spectator.' All that day Bathsheba and Liddy lived in the attic, in a state of barricade, a precaution which proved to be needless, as against Troy, for he did not appear in the neighbourhood or trouble them at all. Bathsheba sat at the window till sunset, sometimes attempting to read, at other times watching every movement outside without much purpose, and listening without much interest to every sound. The sun went down almost blood-red that night, and a livid cloud received its rays in the east. Up against this dark background, the west front of the church tower, the only part of the edifice visible from the farmhouse windows rose distinct and lustrous, the vane upon the summit bristling with rays. Hereabouts at six o'clock the young men of the village gathered, as was their custom, for a game of prisoners' base. The spot had been consecrated to this ancient diversion from time immemorial, the old stocks conveniently forming a base facing the boundary of the churchyard, in front of which the ground was trodden, hard and bare as a pavement, by the players. She could see the brown and black heads of the young lads darting about, right and left, their white shirt-sleeves gleaming in the sun, whilst occasionally a shout and a peal of hearty laughter varied the stillness of the evening air. They continued to play for a quarter of an hour or so, when the game concluded abruptly, and the players leapt over the wall and vanished round to the other side, behind a yew-tree, which was also half behind a beech, now spreading in one mass of golden foliage, on which the branches traced black lines. "'Why did the base players finish their game so suddenly?' Bathsheba inquired, the next time that Liddy entered the room. "'I think twas because two men came just then from Casterbridge, and began putting up a grand carved tombstone,' said Liddy. "'The lads went to see whose it was.' "'Do you know?' Bathsheba asked. "'I don't,' said Liddy. End of chapter 44 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 45 
Troy's Romanticism When Troy's wife had left the house at the previous midnight, his first act was to cover the dead from sight. This done, he ascended the stairs, and throwing himself down upon the bed, dressed as he was, he waited miserably for the morning. Fate had dealt grimly with him through the last four and twenty hours. His day had been spent in a way which varied very materially from his intentions regarding it. There was always an inertia to be overcome in striking out a new line of conduct, not more in ourselves, it seems, than in circumscribing events, which appear as if leagued together to allow no novelties in the way of amelioration. Twenty pounds having been secured from Bathsheba, he had managed to add to the sum every farthing he could muster on his own account, which had been seven pounds ten. With this money, twenty-seven pounds ten in all, he had hastily driven from the gate that morning to keep his appointment with Fanny Robin. On reaching Casterbridge, he left the horse and trap at an inn, and at five minutes before ten came back to the bridge at the lower end of the town, and sat himself upon the parapet. The clocks struck the hour, and no Fanny appeared. In fact, at that moment she was being robed in her grave clothes by two attendants at the Union poorhouse, the first and last tiring women the gentle creature had ever been honoured with. The quarter went, the half-hour. A rush of recollection came upon Troy as he waited. This was the second time she had broken a serious engagement with him. In anger he vowed it should be the last, and at eleven o'clock, when he had lingered and watched the stone of the bridge till he knew every lichen upon their face, and heard the chink of the ripples underneath till they oppressed him, he jumped from his seat, went to the inn for his gig, and in a bitter mood of indifference concerning the past, and recklessness about the future, drove on to Budmouth races. He reached the race-course at two o'clock and remained either there or in the town till nine. But Fanny's image, as it had appeared to him in the sombre shadows of that Saturday evening, returned to his mind, backed up by Bathsheba's reproaches. He vowed he would not bet, and he kept his vow, for on leaving the town at nine o'clock in the evening he had diminished his cash only to the extent of a few shillings. He trotted slowly homeward, and it was now that he was struck for the first time with the thought that Fanny had been really prevented by illness from keeping her promise. This time she could have made no mistake. He regretted that he had not remained in Casterbridge and made inquiries. Reaching home, he quietly unharnessed the horse and came indoors, as we have seen, to the fearful shock that awaited him. As soon as it grew light enough to distinguish objects, Troy arose from the coverlet of the bed, and in a mood of absolute indifference to Bathsheba's whereabouts, and almost oblivious of her existence, he stalked downstairs and left the house by the back door. His walk was towards the churchyard, entering which he searched around till he found a newly dug, unoccupied grave, the grave dug the day before for Fanny. The position of this having been marked, he hastened on to Casterbridge, only pausing and musing for a while at the hill whereon he had last seen Fanny alive. Reaching the town, Troy descended into a side street, and entered a pair of gates surmounted by a board bearing the words, Leicester, Stone and Marble Mason. Within were lying about stones of all sizes and designs, inscribed as being sacred to the memory of unnamed persons, who had not yet died. Troy was so unlike himself now, in look, word, and deed, that the want of likeness was perceptible, even to his own consciousness. His method of engaging himself in the business of purchasing a tomb was that of an absolutely unpractised man. He could not bring himself to consider, calculate, or economize. He waywardly wished for something, and he set about obtaining it, like a child in a nursery. "'I want a good tomb,' he said to the man who stood in the little office within the yard. "'I want as good a one as you can give me for twenty-seven pounds.' It was all the money he possessed— that's some to include everything. Everything. Cutting the name, carriage to Weatherbury, and erection. And I want it now, at once. We could not get anything special work this week. I must have it now. If you would like one of these in stock, it could be got ready immediately. Very well, said Troy impatiently. Let's see what you have. The best I have in stock is this one, said the stonecutter, going into a shed. 
Here's a marble headstone, beautifully crocketed, with medallions beneath of typical subjects. Here's the footstone, after the same pattern, and here's the coping to enclose the grave. The polishing alone of this set cost me eleven pounds. The slabs are of the best kind, and I can warrant them to resist rain and frost for a hundred years without flying. And how much? Well, I could add the name and put it up at Weatherby for the sum you mention. Get it done today, and I'll pay the money now. The man agreed, and wondered at such a mood in a visitor who wore not a shred of mourning. Then Troy wrote the words which were to form the inscription, settled the account, and went away. In the afternoon he came back again, and found that the lettering was almost done. He waited in the yard till the tomb was packed, and saw it placed in the cart and started on its way to Weatherbury, giving directions to the two men who were to accompany it to inquire of the sexton for the grave of the person named in the inscription. It was quite dark when Troy came out of Casterbridge. He carried rather a heavy basket upon his arm, with which he strode moodily along the road, resting occasionally at bridges and gates, whereon he deposited his burden for a time. Midway on his journey he met, returning in the darkness, the men and the wagon which had conveyed the tomb. He merely inquired if the work was done, and, on being assured that it was, passed on again. Troy entered Weatherbury churchyard about ten o'clock, and went immediately to the corner where he had marked the vacant grave early in the morning. It was on the obscure side of the tower, screened to a great extent from the view of passers along the road, a spot which until lately had been abandoned to heaps of stones and bushes of alder, but now it was cleared and made orderly for interments, by reason of the rapid filling of the ground elsewhere. Here now stood the tomb, as the men had stated, snow-white and shapely in the gloom, consisting of a head and footstone, and enclosing border of marble work uniting them. In the midst was mould, suitable for plants. Troy deposited his basket beside the tomb, and vanished for a few minutes. When he returned he carried a spade and a lantern, the light of which he directed for a few moments upon the marble whilst he read the inscription. He hung his lantern on the lowest bough of the yew-tree, and took from his basket flower-roots of several varieties. There were bundles of snowdrops, hyacinths, and crocus-bulbs, violets, and double daisies, which were to bloom in early spring, and of carnations, pinks, picotees, lilies of the valley, forget-me-not, summer farewell, meadow saffron, and others, for the later seasons of the year. Troy lay these out upon the grass, and with an impassive face set to work to plant them. The snowdrops were arranged in a line on the outside of the coping, the remainder within the enclosure of the grave. The crocuses and hyacinths were to grow in rows, some of the summer flowers he placed over her head and feet, the lilies and forget-me-nots over her heart. The remainder were dispersed in the spaces between these. Troy, in his prostration at this time, had no perception that in the futility of these romantic doings, dictated by a remorseful reaction from previous indifference, there was any element of absurdity. Deriving his idiosyncrasies from both sides of the channel, he showed at such junctures as the present the inelasticity of the Englishman, together with that blindness to the line where sentiment verges on mawkishness, characteristic of the French. It was a cloudy, muggy, and very dark night, and the rays from Troy's lantern spread into the two old yews with a strange illuminating power, flickering, as it seemed, up to the black ceiling of cloud above. He felt a large drop of rain upon the back of his hand, and presently one came and entered one of the holes of the lantern, whereupon the candle sputtered and went out. Troy was weary, and it being now not far from midnight, and the rain threatening to increase, he resolved to leave the finishing touches of his labour until the day should break. He groped along the wall and over the graves in the dark till he found himself round at the north side. Here he entered the porch, and, reclining upon the bench within, fell asleep. End of chapter 45 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 46 The Gargoyle Its Doings the tower of Weatherbury Church was a square erection of fourteenth-century date, having two stone gargoyles on each of the four faces of its parapet. 
Of these eight carved protuberances, only two at this time continued to serve the purpose of their erection, that of spouting water from the lead roof within. One mouth in each front had been closed by bygone church wardens as superfluous, and two others were broken away and choked, a matter not of much consequence to the well-being of the tower, for the two mouths which still remained open and active were gaping enough to do all the work. It has been sometimes argued that there is no truer criterion of the vitality of any given art period than the power of the master spirits of that time in grotesque, and certainly in the instance of Gothic art there is no disputing the proposition. Weatherbury Tower was a somewhat early instance of the use of an ornamental parapet in parish as distinct from cathedral churches, and the gargoyles, which are the necessary correlatives of a parapet, were exceptionally prominent of the boldest cut that the hand could shape, and of the most original design that a human brain could conceive. There was, so to speak, that symmetry in their distortion, which is less the characteristic of British than continental grotesques of the period. All the eight were different from each other. A beholder was convinced that nothing on earth could be more hideous than those he saw on the north side, until he went around to the south. Of the two on this latter face, only that at the southeastern corner concerns the story. It was too human to be called like a dragon, too impish to be like a man, too animal to be like a fiend, and not enough like a bird to be called a griffin. This horrible stone entity was fashioned as if covered with a wrinkled hide. It had short, erect ears, eyes starting from their sockets, and its fingers and hands were seizing the corners of its mouth, which they thus seemed to pull open to give free passage to the water it vomited. The lower row of teeth was quite washed away, though the upper still remained. Here and thus, jutting a couple of feet from the wall against which its feet rested as a support, the creature had for four hundred years laughed at the surrounding landscape, voicelessly in dry weather, and in wet with a gurgling and snorting sound. Troy slept on in the porch, and the rain increased outside. Presently the gargoyle spat. In due time a small stream began to trickle through the seventy feet of aerial space between its mouth and the ground, which the water drops smote like duck-shot in their accelerated velocity. The stream thickened in substance and increased in power, gradually spouting further and yet further from the side of the tower. When the rain fell in a steady and ceaseless torrent, the stream dashed downwards in volumes. We follow its course to the ground at this point of time. The end of the liquid parabola has come forward from the wall, has advanced over the plinth mouldings, over a heap of stones, over the marble border into the midst of Fanny Robin's grave. The force of the stream had, until very lately, been received upon some loose stones spread thereabout, which had acted as a shield to the soil under the onset. These, during the summer months, had been cleared from the ground, and there was now nothing to resist the downfall but the bare earth. For several years the stream had not spouted so far from the tower as it was doing on this night, and such a contingency had been overlooked. Sometimes this obscure corner received no inhabitant for the space of two or three years, and then it was usually but a pauper, a poacher, or some sinner of undignified sins. The persistent torrent from the gargoyle's jaws directed all its vengeance into the grave. The rich, tawny mould was stirred into motion and boiled like chocolate. The water accumulated and washed deeper down, and the roar of the pool thus formed spread into the night as the head and chief among other noises of the kind created by the deluging rain. The flowers so carefully planted by Fanny's repentant lover began to move and writhe in their bed. The winter violets turned slowly upside down and became a mere mat of mud. Soon the snowdrops and other bulbs danced in the boiling mass like ingredients in a cauldron. Plants of the tufted species were loosened, rose to the surface, and floated off. Troy did not awake from his comfortless sleep till it was broad day. Not having been in bed for two nights, his shoulders felt stiff, his feet tender, and his head heavy. He remembered his position, arose, shivered, took the spade, and again went out. The rain had quite ceased, and the sun was shining through the green, brown, and yellow leaves, now sparkling and varnished by the raindrops to the brightness of similar effects in the landscapes of Risedale and Hobema, and full of all those infinite beauties that arise from the union of water and colour with high lights. 
The air was rendered so transparent by the heavy fall of rain that the autumn hues of the middle distance were as rich as those near at hand, and the remote fields, intercepted by the angle of the tower, appeared in the same plane as the tower itself. He entered the gravel path which would take him behind the tower. The path, instead of being stony as it had been the night before, was browned over with a thin coating of mud. At one place in the path he saw a tuft of stringy roots, washed white and clean as a bundle of tendons. He picked it up. Surely it could not be one of the primroses he had planted. He saw a bulb, another, and another as he advanced. Beyond doubt they were crocuses. With a face of perplexed dismay, Troy turned the corner and then beheld the wreck the stream had made. The pool upon the grave had soaked away into the ground, and in its place was a hollow. The disturbed earth was washed over the grass and pathway in the guise of the brown mud he had already seen, and had spotted the marble tombstone with the same stains. Nearly all the flowers were washed clean out of the ground, and they lay roots upward on the spots whither they had been splashed by the stream. Troy's brow became heavily contracted. He set his teeth closely, and his compressed lips moved as those of one in great pain. This singular accident, by a strange confluence of emotions in him, was felt as the sharpest sting of all. Troy's face was very expressive, and any observer who had seen him now would hardly have believed him to be a man who had laughed and sung and poured love trifles into a woman's ear. To curse his miserable lot was at first his impulse, but even that lowest stage of rebellion needed an activity whose absence was necessarily antecedent to the existence of the morbid misery which wrung him. The sight, coming as it did, superimposed upon the other dark scenery of the previous days, formed a sort of climax to the whole panorama, and it was more than he could endure. Sanguine by nature, Troy had a power of eluding grief by simply adjourning it. He could put off the consideration of any particular spectre till the matter had become old and softened by time. The planting of flowers on Fanny's grave had been perhaps but a species of illusion of the primary grief and now it was as if his intention had been known and circumvented. Almost for the first time in his life, Troy, as he stood by this dismantled grave, wished himself another man. It is seldom that a person with much animal spirit does not feel that the fact of his life being his own is the one qualification which singles it out as a more hopeful life than that of others who may actually resemble him in every particular. Troy had felt, in his transient way, hundreds of times, that he could not envy other people their condition, because the possession of that condition would have necessitated a different personality, when he desired no other than his own. He had not minded the peculiarities of his birth, the vicissitudes of his life, the meteor-like uncertainty of all that related to him, because these appertained to the hero of his story, without whom there would have been no story at all for him and it seemed to be only in the nature of things that matters would right themselves at some proper date and wind up well. This very morning the illusion completed its disappearance, and, as it were, all of a sudden Troy hated himself. The suddenness was probably more apparent than real. A coral reef which just comes short of the ocean's surface is no more to the horizon than if it had never been begun, and the mere finishing stroke is what often appears to create an event which has long been potentially an accomplished thing. He stood and meditated, a miserable man. Whither should he go? He that is accursed, let him be accursed still, was a pitiless anathema written in this spoilated effort of his newborn solicitousness. A man who has spent his primal strength in journeying in one direction has not much spirit left for reversing his course. Troy had, since yesterday, faintly reversed his, but the merest opposition had disheartened him. To turn about would have been hard enough under the greatest providential encouragement, but to find that providence, far from helping him into a new course, or showing any wish that he might adopt one, actually jeered his first trembling and critical attempt in that kind, was more than nature could bear. He slowly withdrew from the grave. He did not attempt to fill up the hole, replace the flowers, or do anything at all. He simply threw up his cards and forswore his game for that time and always. Going out of the churchyard silently and unobserved, none of the villagers having yet risen, he passed down some fields at the back, and emerged just as secretly upon the high road. 
Shortly afterwards he had gone from the village. Meanwhile Bathsheba remained a voluntary prisoner in the attic. The door was kept locked, except during the entries and exits of Liddy, for whom a bed had been arranged in a small adjoining room. The light of Troy's lantern in the churchyard was noticed about ten o'clock by the maid's servant, who casually glanced from the window in that direction whilst taking her supper, and she called Bathsheba's attention to it. They looked curiously at the phenomenon for a time, until Liddy was sent to bed. Bathsheba did not sleep very heavily that night. When her attendant was unconscious and softly breathing in the next room, the mistress of the house was still looking out of the window at the faint gleam spreading from among the trees, not in a steady shine, but blinking like a revolving coast-light, though this appearance failed to suggest to her that a person was passing and repassing in front of it. Bathsheba sat here till it began to rain, and the light vanished, when she withdrew to lie restlessly in her bed, and re-enact in a worn mind the lurid scene of yesternight. Almost before the first faint sign of dawn appeared, she arose again, and opened the window to obtain a full breathing of the new morning air. The panes being now wet with trembling tears left by the night rain, each one rounded with a pale luster caught from primrose-hued slashes through a cloud low down in the awakening sky. From the trees came the sound of a steady dripping upon the drifted leaves underneath them, and from the direction of the church she could hear another noise, peculiar and not intermittent like the rest, the pearl of water falling into a pool. Liddy knocked at eight o'clock, and Bathsheba unlocked the door. "'What a heavy rain we had in the night, ma'am!' said Liddy, when her inquiries about breakfast had been made. "'Yes, very heavy. Did you hear the strange noise from the churchyard?' I heard one strange noise. I've been thinking it must have been the water from the tower spouts. Well, that's what the shepherd was saying, ma'am. He's now gone on to sea. Oh, Gabriel has been here this morning. Only just looked in in passing, quite in his old way, which I thought he had left off lately. But the tower spouts used to spatter on the stones, and we were puzzled, for this was like the boiling of a pot. Not being able to read, think, or work, Bathsheba asked Liddy to stay and breakfast with her. The tongue of the more childish woman still ran upon recent events. "'Are you going across to the church, ma'am?' she asked. "'Not that I know of,' said Bathsheba. "'I thought you might like to go and see where they have put Fanny. The trees hide the place from your window.' Bathsheba had all sorts of dreads about meeting her husband. "'Has Mr. Troy been in tonight?' she said. "'No, ma'am, I think he's gone to Budmouth.' Budmouth. The sound of the word carried with it a much diminished perspective of him and his deeds. There were thirteen miles' interval betwixt them now. She hated questioning Liddy about her husband's movements, and indeed had hitherto sedulously avoided doing so. But now all the house knew that there had been some dreadful disagreement between them, and it was futile to attempt disguise. Bathsheba had reached a stage at which people ceased to have any appreciative regard for public opinion. "'What makes you think he has gone there?' she said. "'Laban Tall saw him on the Budmouth Road this morning before breakfast.' Bathsheba was momentarily relieved of that wayward heaviness of the past twenty-four hours, which had quenched the vitality of youth in her, without substituting the philosophy of maturer years, and she resolved to go out and walk a little way. So, when breakfast was over, she put on her bonnet, and took a direction towards the church. It was nine o'clock, and the men, having returned to work again from their first meal, she was not likely to meet any of them in the road. Knowing that Fanny had been laid in the reprobate's quarter of the graveyard, called in the parish behind church, which was invisible from the road, it was impossible to resist the impulse to enter and look upon a spot which, from nameless feelings, she had at the same time dreaded to see. She had been unable to overcome an impression that some connection existed between her rival and the light through the trees. Bathsheba skirted the buttress, and beheld the hole and the tomb, its delicately veined surface splashed and stained, just as Troy had seen it and left it two hours earlier. On the other side of the scene stood Gabriel. His eyes, too, were fixed on the tomb, and her arrival having been noiseless, she had not as yet attracted his attention. Bathsheba did not at once perceive that the grand tomb and the disturbed grave were Fanny's, and she looked on both sides and around for some humbler mound, earthed up and clodded in the usual way. 
Then her eye followed Oak's, and she read the words with which the inscription opened. Erected by Francis Troy, in beloved memory of Fanny Robin. Oak saw her, and his first act was to gaze inquiringly and learn how she received this knowledge of the authorship of the work, which to himself had caused considerable astonishment. But such discoveries did not much affect her now. Emotional convulsions seemed to have become the commonplaces of her history, and she bade him good morning, and asked him to fill in the hole with the spade which was standing by. While Stoke was doing as she desired, Bathsheba collected the flowers, and began planting them with that sympathetic manipulation of roots and leaves which is so conspicuous in a woman's gardening, and which flowers seem to understand and thrive upon. She requested Oak to get the church wardens to turn the leadwork at the mouth of the gargoyle that hung gaping down upon them, that by this means the stream might be directed sideways, and a repetition of the accident prevented. Finally, with the superfluous magnanimity of a woman whose narrower instincts have brought down bitterness upon her instead of love, she wiped the mud from the tomb, as if she rather liked its words than otherwise, and went again home. End of chapter 46 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 47 Adventures by the Shore Troy wandered along towards the south. A composite feeling, made up of disgust with the, to him, humdrum tediousness of a farmer's life, gloomy images of her who lay in the churchyard, remorse, and a general averseness to his wife's society, impelled him to seek a home in any place on earth save Weatherbury. The sad accessories of Fanny's end confronted him as vivid pictures which threatened to be indelible, and made life in Bathsheba's house intolerable. At three in the afternoon he found himself at the foot of a slope more than a mile in length, which ran to the ridge of a range of hills lying parallel with the shore, and forming a monotonous barrier between the basin of cultivated country inland and the wilder scenery of the coast. Up the hill stretched a road, nearly straight and perfectly white, the two sides approaching each other in a gradual taper, till they met the sky at the top about two miles off. Throughout the length of this narrow and irksome inclined plain, not a sign of life was visible on this garish afternoon. Troy toiled up the road with a languor and depression greater than any he had experienced for many a day and year before. The air was warm and muggy and the top seemed to recede as he approached. At last he reached the summit, and a wide and novel prospect burst upon him, with an effect almost like that of the Pacific upon Balboa's gaze. The broad, steely sea, marked only by faint lines, which had a semblance of being etched thereon to a degree not deep enough to disturb its general evenness, stretched the whole width of his front and round to the right, where, near the town and port of Budmouth, the sun bristled down upon it, and banished all colour, to substitute in its place a clear, oily polish. Nothing moved in sky, land, or sea, except a frill of milk-white foam along the nearer angles of the shore, shreds of which licked the contiguous stones like tongues. He descended, and came to a small basin of sea enclosed by the cliffs. Troy's nature freshened within him. He thought he would rest and bathe here before going further. He undressed and plunged in. Inside the cove the water was uninteresting to a swimmer, being smooth as a pond, and to get a little of the ocean's swell Troy presently swam between the two projecting spurs of rock which formed the pillars of Hercules to this miniature Mediterranean. Unfortunately for Troy, a current unknown to him existed outside, which, unimportant to craft of any burden, was awkward for a swimmer who might be taken in it unawares. Troy found himself carried to the left, and then round in a swoop out to sea. He now recollected the place and its sinister character. Many bathers had there prayed for a dry death from time to time, and, like Gonzalo, also had been unanswered and Troy began to deem it possible that he might be added to their number. Not a boat of any kind was at present within sight, but far in the distance Budmouth lay upon the sea, as it were quietly regarding his efforts, and beside the town the harbour showed its position by a dim meshwork of ropes and spars. After well nigh exhausting himself in attempts to get back to the mouth of the cove, in his weakness swimming several inches deeper than was his wont, 
keeping up his breathing entirely by his nostrils, turning upon his back a dozen times over, swimming on Papillon, and so on, Troy resolved as a last resort to tread water at a slight incline, and so endeavour to reach the shore at any point, merely giving himself a gentle impetus inwards whilst carried on in the general direction of the tide. This necessarily a slow process he found to be not altogether so difficult, and though there was no choice of a landing place, the objects on shore passing by him in a sad and slow procession, he perceptibly approached the extremity of a spit of land yet further to the right, now well defined against the sunny portion of the horizon. While the swimmer's eyes were fixed upon the spit, as his only means of salvation on this side of the unknown, a moving object broke the outline of the extremity, and immediately a ship's boat appeared manned with several sailor lads, her bows towards the sea. All Troy's vigour spasmodically revived, to prolong the struggle yet a little further. Swimming with his right arm, he held up his left to hail them, splashing upon the waves and shouting with all his might. From the position of the setting sun, his white form was distinctly visible upon the now deep-hued bosom of the sea to the east of the boat, and the men saw him at once. Backing their oars and putting the boat about, they pulled towards him with a will, and in five or six minutes from the time of his first halloo, two of the sailors hauled him over the stern. They formed part of a brig's crew, and had come ashore for sand. Lending him what little clothing they could spare among them, as a slight protection against the rapidly cooling air, they agreed to land them in the morning, and without further delay, for it was growing late, they made again towards the roadstead where their vessel lay. And now night drooped slowly upon the wide watery levels in front, and at no great distance from them, where the shoreline curved round, and formed a long ribbon of shade upon the horizon, a series of points of yellow light began to start into existence, denoting the spot to be the site of Budmouth, where the lamps were being lighted along the parade. The cluck of their oars was the only sound of any distinctness upon the sea, and as they laboured amid the thickening shades, the lamplights grew larger, each appearing to send a flaming sword deep down into the waves before it until there arose, among other dim shapes of the kind, the form of the vessel for which they were bound. End of chapter 47 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 48 Doubts arise, doubts linger. Bathsheba underwent the enlargement of her husband's absence from hours to days, with a slight feeling of surprise and a slight feeling of relief, yet neither sensation rose at any time far above the level commonly designated as indifference. She belonged to him. The certainties of that position were so well defined, and the reasonable probabilities of its issue so bounded that she could not speculate on contingencies. Taking no further interest in herself as a splendid woman, she acquired the indifferent feelings of an outsider in contemplating her probable fate as a singular wretch, for Bathsheba drew herself and her future in colours that no reality could exceed for darkness. Her original vigorous pride of youth had sickened, and with it had declined all her anxieties about coming years, since anxiety recognises a better and a worse alternative, and Bathsheba had made up her mind that alternatives on any noteworthy scale had ceased for her. Soon or later, and that not very late, her husband would be home again, and then the days of their tenancy of the upper farm would be numbered. There had originally been shown by the agent to the estate some distrust of Bathsheba's tenure as James Everdeen's successor, on the score of her sex, and her youth, and her beauty. But the peculiar nature of her uncle's will, his own frequent testimony before his death to her cleverness in such a pursuit, and her vigorous marshalling of the numerous flocks and herds, which came suddenly into her hands before negotiations were concluded, had won confidence in her powers, and no further objections had been raised. She had latterly been in great doubt as to what the legal effects of her marriage would be upon her position, but no notice had been taken as yet of her change of name, and only one point was clear that in the event of her own or her husband's inability to meet the agent at the forthcoming January rent-day, very little consideration would be shown, and, for that matter, very little would be deserved. Once out of the farm, the approach of poverty would be sure. 
Hence Bathsheba lived in a perception that her purposes were broken off. She was not a woman who could hope without good materials for the process, differing thus from the less far-sighted and energetic, though more petted ones of the sex, with whom hope goes on as a sort of clockwork, which the merest food and shelter are sufficient to wind up, and perceiving clearly that her mistake had been a fatal one, she accepted her position, and waited coldly for the end. The first Saturday after Troy's departure she went to Castleridge alone, a journey she had not before taken since her marriage. On this Saturday Bathsheba was passing slowly on foot through the crowd of rural businessmen, gathered as usual in front of the market-house, who were as usual gazed upon by the burghers with feelings that those healthy lives were dearly paid for, by exclusion from possible aldermanship, when a man, who had apparently been following her, said some words to another on her left hand. Bathsheba's ears were keen as those of any wild animal, and she distinctly heard what the speaker said, though her back was towards him. "'I am looking for Mrs. Troy. Is that she there?' "'Yes, that's the young lady, I believe,' said the person addressed. "'I have some awkward news to break to her. Her husband is drowned.' As if endowed with the spirit of prophecy, Bathsheba gasped out, "'No, it is not true, it cannot be true.' Then she said and heard no more. The ice of self-command which had latterly gathered over her was broken, and the currents burst forth again, and overwhelmed her. A darkness came into her eyes, and she fell, but not to the ground. A gloomy man, who had been observing her from under the portico of the old corn exchange, when she passed through the group without, stepped quickly to her side at the moment of her exclamation, and caught her in his arms as she sank down. "'What is it?' said Boldwood, looking up at the bringer of the bad news, as he supported her. Her husband was drowned this week, while bathing in Lulwind Cove. A coast guardsman found his clothes, and brought them into Budmouth yesterday. Thereupon a strange fire lighted up in Boldwood's eye, and his face flushed with the suppressed excitement of an unutterable thought. Everybody's glance was now centred upon him and the unconscious Bathsheba. He lifted her bodily off the ground, and smoothed down the folds of her dress, as a child might have taken a storm-beaten bird, and arranged its ruffled plumes, and bore her along the pavement to the King's Arms Inn. Here he passed with her under the archway into a private room, and by the time he had deposited, so loathly, the precious burden upon a sofa, Bathsheba had opened her eyes. Remembering all that occurred, she murmured, "'I want to go home.' Boldwood left the room. He stood for a moment in the passage to recover his senses. The experience had been too much for his consciousness to keep up with, and now that he had grasped it, it had gone again. For those few heavenly golden moments she had been in his arms. What did it matter about her not knowing it? She had been close to his breast, and he had been close to hers. He started onward again, and sending a woman to her, went out to ascertain all the facts of the case. These appeared to be limited to what he had already heard. He then ordered her horse to be put into the gig, and when all was ready returned to inform her. He found that, though still pale and unwell, she had in the meantime sent for the Budmouth man who had brought the tidings, and learnt from him all there was to know. Being hardly in a condition to drive home, as she had driven to town, Boldwood, with every delicacy of manner and feeling, offered to get her a driver or to give her a seat in his phaeton, which was more comfortable than her own conveyance. These proposals Bathsheba gently declined, and the farmer at once departed. About half an hour later she invigorated herself by an effort, and took her seat and the reins as usual, in external appearance much as if nothing had happened. She went out of the town by a tortuous back street, and drove slowly along, unconscious of the road and the scene. The first shades of evening were showing themselves when Bathsheba reached home, where, silently alighting and leaving the horse in the hands of the boy, she proceeded at once upstairs. Liddy met her on the landing. The news had preceded Bathsheba to Weatherbury by half an hour, and Liddy looked inquiringly into her mistress's face. Bathsheba had nothing to say. She entered her bedroom and sat by the window, and thought and thought till night enveloped her and the extreme lines only of her shape were visible. Somebody came to the door, knocked, and opened it. "'Well, what is it, Liddy?' she said. 
"'I was thinking there must be something got for you to wear,' said Liddy, with hesitation. "'What do you mean?' "'Morning.' "'No, no, no,' said Bathsheba, hurriedly. "'But I suppose there must be something done for poor—' "'Not at present, I think. It is not necessary.' "'Why not, ma'am?' "'Because he is still alive.' "'How do you know that?' said Liddy, amazed. "'I don't know it. But wouldn't it have been different, or shouldn't I have heard more? Or wouldn't they have found him, Liddy? Or I don't know how it is, but death would have been different from how it this is. I am perfectly convinced that he is still alive.' Bathsheba remained firm in this opinion till Monday, when two circumstances conjoined to shake it. The first was a short paragraph in the local newspaper, which, beyond making, by a methodizing pen, formidable presumptive evidence of Troy's death by drowning, contained the important testimony of a young Mr. Barker, M.D., of Budmouth, who spoke to being an eye-witness of the accident in a letter to the editor. In this he stated that he was passing over the cliff on the remoter side of the cove just as the sun was setting. At that time he saw a bather carried along in the current outside the mouth of the cove, and guessed in an instant that there was but a poor chance for him, unless he should be possessed of unusual muscular powers. He drifted behind a projection of the coast, and Mr. Barker followed along the shore in the same direction. But by the time that he could reach an elevation sufficiently great to command a view of the sea beyond, dusk had set in, and nothing further was to be seen. The other circumstance was the arrival of his clothes, when it became necessary for her to examine and identify them, though this had virtually been done long before by those who inspected the letters in his pockets. It was so evident to her in the midst of her agitation that Troy had undressed in the full conviction of dressing again almost immediately, that the notion that anything but death could have prevented him was a perverse one to entertain. Then Bathsheba said to herself that others were assured in their opinion, strange that she should not be. A strange reflection occurred to her, causing her face to flush. Suppose that Troy had followed Fanny into another world. Had he done this intentionally? yet contrived to make his death appear like an accident? Nevertheless, this thought of how the apparent might differ from the real, made vivid by her bygone jealousy of Fanny, and the remorse he had shown that night, did not blind her to the perception of a likelier difference, less tragic, but to herself far more disastrous. When alone late that evening beside a small fire, and much calmed down, Bathsheba took Troy's watch into her hand, which had been restored to her with the rest of the articles belonging to him. She opened the case as he had opened it before her a week ago. There was a little coil of pale hair, which had been as the fuse to this great explosion. He was hers, and she was his. They should be gone together, she said. I am nothing to either of them, and why should I keep her hair? She took it in her hand and held it over the fire. No. I'll not burn it. I'll keep it in memory of her, poor thing," she added, snatching back her hand. End of chapter 48 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 49 Oak's Advancement A Great Hope The later autumn and the winter drew on apace and the leaves lay thick upon the turf of the glades and the mosses of the woods. Bathsheba, having previously been living in a state of suspended feeling which was not suspense, now lived in a mood of quietude which was not precisely peacefulness. While she had known him to be alive, she could have thought of his death with equanimity, but now that it might be she had lost him, she regretted that he was not still hers. She kept the farm going, raked in her profits without caring keenly about them, and expended money on ventures because she had done so in bygone days, which, though not long gone by, seemed infinitely removed from her present. She looked back upon that past over a great gulf, as if she were now a dead person, having the faculty of meditation still left in her, by means of which, like the mouldering gentlefolk of the poet's story, she could sit and ponder what a gift life used to be. However, one excellent result of her general apathy was the long-delayed installation of Oak as bailiff, but he, having virtually exercised that function for a long time already, the change, beyond the substantial increase of wages it brought, 
was little more than a nominal one addressed to the outside world. Boldwood lived secluded and inactive. Much of his wheat and all of his barley of that season had been spoilt by the rain. It sprouted, grew into intricate mats, and was ultimately thrown to the pigs in armfuls. The strange neglect which had produced this ruin and waste became the subject of whispered talk among all the people round, and it was elicited from one of Boldwood's men that forgetfulness had nothing to do with it, for he had been reminded of the danger to his corn as many times and as persistently as inferiors dared to do. The sight of the pigs turning in disgust from the rotten ears seemed to arouse Boldwood, and he one evening sent for Oak. Whether it was suggested by Bathsheba's recent act of promotion or not, the farmer proposed at the interview that Gabriel should undertake the superintendence of the lower farm as well as of Bathsheba's, because of the necessity Boldwood felt for such aid, and the impossibility of discovering a more trustworthy man. Gabriel's malignant star was assuredly setting fast. Bathsheba, when she learnt of this proposal, for Oak was obliged to consult her, at first languidly objected. She considered that the two farms together were too extensive for the observation of one man. Boldwood, who was apparently determined by personal rather than commercial reasons, suggested that Oak should be furnished with a horse for his sole use, when the plan would present no difficulty, the two farms lying side by side. Boldwood did not directly communicate with her during these negotiations, only speaking to Oak, who was the go-between throughout. All was harmoniously arranged at last, and we now see Oak mounted on a strong cob, and daily trotting the length and breadth of about two thousand acres in a cheerful spirit of surveillance, as if the crops all belonged to him, the actual mistress of the one half and the master of the other, sitting in their respective homes in gloomy and sad seclusion. Out of this there arose, during the spring succeeding, a talk in the parish that Gabriel Oak was feathering his nest fast. "'Whatever do you think?' said Susan Tall. "'Gable Oak is coming quite a dand. "'He now wears shining boots with hardly a hob in them two or three times a week, "'and a tall hat of Sundays, and I hardly knows the name of a smock-frock. "'When I see people strut enough to be cut up into bantam cocks, "'I stand dormant with wonder, and says no more.' It was eventually known that Gabriel, though paid a fixed wage by Bathsheba, independent of the fluctuations of agricultural profits, had made an engagement with Boldwood by which Oak was to receive a share of the receipts. A small share, certainly, yet it was money of a higher quality than mere wages, and capable of expansion in a way that wages were not. Some were becoming to consider Oak a near man, for though his condition had thus far improved, he lived in no better style than before, occupying the same cottage, repairing his own potatoes, mending his stockings, and sometimes even making his bed with his own hands. But as Oak was not only provokingly indifferent to public opinion, but a man who clung persistently to old habits and usages simply because they were old, there was room for doubt as to his motives. A great hope had latterly germinated in Boldwood, whose unreasoning devotion to Bathsheba could only be characterised as a fond madness, which neither time nor circumstance, evil nor good report, could weaken nor destroy. This fevered hope had grown up again, like a grain of mustard seed, during the quiet which followed the hasty conjecture that Troy was drowned. He nourished it fearfully and almost shunned the contemplation of it in earnest, lest facts should reveal the wildness of his dream. Bathsheba, having at last been persuaded to wear mourning, her appearance as she entered the church in that guise was in itself a weekly addition to his faith that a time was coming, very far off perhaps, yet surely nearing, when his waiting on events should have its reward. How long he might have to wait he had not yet closely considered, what he would try to recognise was that the severe schooling she had been subjected to had made Bathsheba much more considerate than she had formerly been of the feelings of others, and he trusted that, should she be willing at any time in the future to marry any man at all, that man would be himself. There was a substratum of good feeling in her. Her self-reproach for the injury she had thoughtlessly done him might be depended upon now to a much greater extent than before her infatuation and disappointment. It would be possible to approach her by the channel of her good nature, and to suggest a friendly business-like compact between them for fulfilment at some future day, 
keeping the passionate side of his desire entirely out of her sight. Such was Boldwood's hope. To the eyes of the middle-aged, Bathsheba was perhaps additionally charming just now. Her exuberance of spirit was pruned down. The original phantom of delight had shown herself to be not too bright for human nature's daily food, and she had been able to enter this second poetical phase without losing much of the first in the process. Bathsheba's return from a two-month's visit to her old aunt at Norcombe afforded the impassioned and yearning farmer a pretext for inquiring directly after her, now possibly in the ninth month of her widowhood, and endeavouring to get a notion of her state of mind regarding him. This occurred in the middle of the haymaking, and Boldwood contrived to be near Liddy, who was assisting in the fields. "'I am glad to see you out of doors, Lydia,' he said pleasantly. She simpered, and wondered in her heart why he should speak so frankly to her. "'I hope Mrs. Troy is quite well after her long absence,' he continued, in a manner expressing that the coldest-hearted neighbour could scarcely say less about her. "'She is quite well, sir.' "'And cheerful, I suppose?' "'Yes, cheerful.' "'Fearful, did you say?' "'Oh, no, I merely said she was cheerful.' "'Tells you all her affairs?' "'No, sir.' "'Some of them?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Mrs. Troy puts much confidence in you, Lydia, and very wisely, perhaps.' "'She do, sir. I've been with her all through her troubles, and was with her at the time of Mr. Troy's going and all.' And if she were to marry again, I expect I should bide with her. She promises that you shall, quite natural, said the strategic lover, throbbing throughout him at the presumption which Liddy's words appeared to warrant, that his darling had thought of remarriage. No, she doesn't promise it exactly. I merely judge on my own account. Yes, yes, I understand. When she alludes to the possibility of marrying again, you conclude— She never do allude to it, sir— said Liddy, thinking how very stupid Mr. Boldwood was getting. "'Of course not,' he returned hastily, his hope falling again. "'You needn't quite take such long reaches with your rake, Lydia. Short and quick ones are best. Well, perhaps, as she is absolute mistress again now, it is wise of her to resolve never to give up her freedom.' "'My mistress did certainly once say, and though not seriously, that she supposed she might marry again at the end of seven years from last year.' "'if she cared to risk Mr. Troy's coming back and claiming her.' "'Ah, six years from the present time. "'Said that she might. "'She might marry at once, in every reasonable person's opinion, "'whatever the lawyers may say to the contrary.' "'Have you been to ask them?' said Liddy innocently. "'Not I,' said Boldwood, growing red. "'Liddy, you needn't stay here a minute longer than you wish, "'so Mr. Oak says. "'I'm now going on a little further. "'Good afternoon.' He went away, vexed with himself, and ashamed for having this one time in his life done anything which could be called underhand. Poor Boldwood had no more skill in finesse than a battering ram, and he was uneasy with the sense of having made himself to appear stupid, and, what was worse, mean. But he had, after all, lighted upon one fact by way of repayment. It was a singularly fresh and fascinating fact, and, though not without its sadness, it was pertinent and real. In little more than six years from this time, Bathsheba might certainly marry him. There was something definite in that hope, for admitting that there might have been no deep thought in her words to Liddy about marriage, they showed at least her creed on the matter. This pleasant notion was now continually in his mind. Six years were a long time, but how much shorter than never. The idea he had for so long been obliged to endure. Jacob had served twice seven years for Rachel— what were six for such a woman as this? He tried to like the notion of waiting for her better than that of winning her at once. Boldwood felt his love to be so deep and strong and eternal that it was possible she had never yet known its full volume, and this patience in delay would afford him an opportunity of giving sweet proof to the point. He would annihilate the six years of his life as if they were minutes, so little did he value his time on earth beside her love. He would let her see— all those six years of intangible ethereal courtship, how little care he had for anything but as it bore upon the consummation. Meanwhile, the early and late summer brought round the week in which Greenhill Fair was held. This fair was frequently attended by the folk of Weatherbury. End of chapter 49
Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 50 The Sheep Fair Troy Touches His Wife's Hand Green Hill was the Nijni Novgorod of South Wessex, and the busiest, merriest, noisiest day of the whole statute number was the day of the Sheep Fair. This yearly gathering was upon the summit of a hill which retained in good preservation the remains of an ancient earthwork, consisting of a huge rampart and entrenchment of an oval form encircling the top of the hill, though somewhat broken down here and there. To each of the two chief openings on opposite sides a winding road ascended, and the level green space of ten or fifteen acres, enclosed by the bank, was the site of the fair. A few permanent erections dotted the spot, but the majority of visitors patronized canvas alone for resting and feeding under during the time of their sojourn here. Shepherds who attended with their flocks from long distances started from home two or three days, or even a week, before the fair, driving their charges a few miles each day, not more than ten or twelve, and resting them at night in hired fields by the wayside at previously chosen points, where they fed having fasted since morning. The shepherd of each flock marched behind, a bundle containing his kit for the week strapped upon his shoulders, and in his hand his crook, which he used as the staff of his pilgrimage. Several of the sheep would get worn and lame, and occasionally a lambing occurred on the road. To meet these contingencies there was frequently provided to accompany the flocks from the remoter points a pony and wagon into which the weekly ones were taken for the remainder of the journey. The weathery farms, however, were no such long distance from the hill, and those arrangements were not necessary in their case. But the large united flocks of Bathsheba and Farmer Boldwood formed a valuable and imposing multitude which demanded much attention, and on this account Gabriel, in addition to Boldwood's shepherd and Cain Ball, accompanied them along the way, through the decayed old town of Kingsbeer, and upward to the plateau, old George the dog, of course, behind them. When the autumn sun slanted over Green Hill this morning, and lighted the dewy flat upon its crest, nebulous clouds of dust were to be seen, floating between the pairs of hedges which streaked the wide prospect around in all directions. These gradually converged upon the base of the hill, and the flocks became individually visible, climbing the serpentine ways which led to the top. Thus, in a slow procession, they entered the opening to which the roads tended, multitude after multitude, horned and hornless, blue flocks and red flocks, buff flocks and brown flocks, even green and salmon-tinted flocks, according to the fancy of the colorist and custom of the farm. Men were shouting, dogs were barking, with greatest animation, but the thronging travellers in so long a journey had grown nearly indifferent to such terrors, though they still bleated piteously at the unwantedness of their experiences. A tall shepherd, rising here and there in the midst of them, like a gigantic idol, amid a crowd of prostrate devotees. The great mass of sheep in the fair consisted of South Downs and the old Wessex horned breeds. To the latter class Bathsheba's and Farmer Boldwood's mainly belonged. These filed in about nine o'clock, their vermiculated horns lopping gracefully on either side of their cheeks in geometrically perfect spirals, a small pink-and-white ear nestling under each horn. Before and behind came other varieties, perfect leopards as to the full, rich substance of their coats, and only lacking the spots. There were also a few of the Oxfordshire breeds, whose wool was beginning to curl like a child's flaxen hair, though surpassed in this respect by the effeminate Leicesters, which were in turn less curly than the Cotswolds. But the most picturesque by far was the small flock of Exmoors, which chanced to be there this year. Their pied faces and legs, dark and heavy horns, tresses of wool hanging round their swarthy foreheads, quite relieved the monotony of the flocks in that quarter. All these bleating, panting, and weary thousands had entered, and were penned before the morning had far advanced, the dog belonging to each flock being tied to the corner of the pen containing it. Alleys for pedestrians intersected the pens, which soon became crowded with buyers and sellers, from far and near. In another part of the hill an altogether different scene began to force itself upon the eye towards midday. A circular tent, of exceptional newness and size, was in course of erection here. 
As the day drew on, the flocks began to change hands, lightening the shepherds' responsibilities, and they turned their attention to this tent and inquired of a man at work there, whose soul seemed concentrated on tying a bothering knot in no time, what was going on. "'The Royal Hippodrome performance of Turnpike's ride to York and the death of Black Bess,' replied the man promptly, without turning his eyes or leaving off tying. As soon as the tent was completed, the band struck up highly stimulating harmonies, and the announcement was publicly made. Black Bess, standing in a conspicuous position on the outside, as a living proof, if proof were wanted, of the truth of the ocular utterances from the stage over which the people were to enter. These were so convinced by such genuine appeals to heart and understanding both, that they soon began to crowd in abundantly. Among the foremost being visible Jan Coggins and Joseph Poorgrass, who are holiday-keeping here to-day. "'That's the great ruffin pushing me!' screamed a woman in front of Jan, over her shoulder at him, when the rush was at its fiercest. "'How can I help pushing ye when folk behind push me?' said Coggan, in a deprecating tone, turning his head towards the aforesaid folk as far as he could, without turning his body, which was jammed as in a vice. There was a silence, then the drums and trumpets again set forth their echoing notes. The crowd was again ecstasized, and gave another lurch, in which Coggan and Poorgrass were again thrust by those behind, upon the women in front. "'Oh, that helpless female should be at the mercy of such ruffins!' exclaimed one of the ladies again, as she swayed like a reed shaken by the wind. "'Now,' said Coggan, appealing in an earnest voice to the public at large, as it stood clustered about his shoulder-blades. "'Did ye ever hear such an unreasonable woman as that? Upon my carcass, neighbours, if I could only get out with this cheese-ring, the damn women might eat the show for me.' "'Oh, don't lose your temper, Jan,' implored Joseph Poorgrass in a whisper. "'They might get their men to murder us, for I think by the shine in their eyes that they be a sinful form of womankind.' Jan held his tongue, as if he had no objection to be pacified, to please a friend, and they gradually reached the foot of the ladder, poor grass being flattened like a jumping-jack, and the sixpence, for admission, which he had got ready half an hour earlier, having become so reeking hot in the tight squeeze of his excited hand, that the woman in spangles, brazen rings set with glass diamonds, and with chalked face and shoulders, who took the money of him, hastily dropped it again from a fear that some trick had been played to burn her fingers. So they all entered, and the cloth of the tent, to the eyes of an observer on the outside, became bulged into innumerable pimples, such as we observe on a sack of potatoes, caused by the various human heads, backs, and elbows at high pressure within. At the rear of the large tent there were two small dressing tents. One of these, allotted to the male performers, was partitioned into halves by a cloth, and in one of the divisions there was sitting on the grass, pulling on a pair of jack-boots, a young man whom we instantly recognise as Sergeant Troy. Troy's appearance in this position may be briefly accounted for. The brig aboard which he was taken to Budmouth Roads was about to start on a voyage, though somewhat short of hands. Troy read the articles and joined, but before they sailed a boat was dispatched across the bay to Lulwind Cove, as he had half suspected, his clothes were gone. He ultimately worked his passage to the United States, where he made a precarious living in various towns as professor of gymnastics, sword exercise, fencing, and pugilism. A few months were sufficient to give him a distaste for this kind of life. There was a certain animal form of refinement in his nature, and however pleasant a strange condition might be whilst privations were easily warded off, it was disadvantageously coarse when money was short. There was ever present, too, the idea that he could claim a home and its comforts did he but choose to return to England and Weatherbury Farm. Whether Bathsheba thought him dead was a frequent subject of curious conjecture. To England he did return at last, but the fact of drawing nearer to Weatherbury abstracted its fascinations, and his intention to enter his old groove at the place became modified. It was with gloom he considered on landing at Liverpool that, if he were to go home, his reception would be of a kind very unpleasant to contemplate, for what Troy had in the way of emotion was an occasional fitful sentiment, which sometimes caused him as much inconvenience as emotion of a strong and healthy kind. Bathsheba was not a woman to be made a fool of, 
or a woman to suffer in silence, and how could he endure existence with a spirited wife, to whom at first entering he would be beholden for food and lodging? Moreover, it was not at all unlikely that his wife would fail at her farming, if she had not already done so, and he would then become liable for her maintenance. And what a life such a future of poverty with her would be, the spectre of Fanny constantly between them, harrowing his temper and embittering her words. Thus, for reasons touching on distaste, regret, and shame commingled, he put off his return from day to day, and would have decided to put it off altogether if he could have found anywhere else the ready-made establishment which existed for him there. At this time, the July preceding the September in which we find him at Greenhill Fair, he fell in with a travelling circus, which was performing in the outskirts of a northern town. Troy introduced himself to the manager by taming a restive horse of the troop, hitting a suspended apple with a pistol bullet fired from the animal's back when in full gallop, and other feats. For his merits in these, all more or less based upon his experiences as a dragoon guardsman, Troy was taken into the company, and the play of Turpin was prepared with a view to his personation of the chief character. Troy was not greatly elated by the appreciative spirit in which he was undoubtedly treated, but he thought the engagement might afford him a few weeks for consideration. It was thus, carelessly, and without having formed any definite plan for the future, that Troy found himself at Greenhill Fair, with the rest of the company, on this day. And now the mild autumn sun got lower, and in front of the pavilion the following incident had taken place. Bathsheba, who was driven to the fair that day by her odd man, Poorgrass, had, like everyone else, read or heard the announcement that Mr. Francis, the great cosmopolitan equestrian and rough rider, would enact the part of Turpin, and she was not yet too old and careworn to be without a little curiosity to see him. This particular show was by far the largest and grandest in the fair, a horde of little shows grouping themselves under its shade like chickens round a hen. The crowd had passed in, and Boldwood, who had been watching all the day for an opportunity of speaking to her, seeing her comparatively isolated, came up to her side. "'I hope the sheep have done well today, Mrs. Troy,' he said nervously. "'Oh, yes, thank you,' said Bathsheba, colour springing up in the centre of her cheeks. "'I was fortunate enough to sell them all just as we got upon the hill, so we hadn't to pen them at all.' "'And now you are entirely at leisure?' "'Yes, except that I have to see one more dealer in two hours' time. Otherwise I should be going home.' He was looking at this large tent and the announcement. Have you ever seen the play of Turpin's Ride to York? Turpin was a real man, was he not? Oh, yes, and perfectly true, all of it. Indeed, I think I've heard Jan Coggan say that a relation of his knew Tom King, Turpin's friend, quite well. Coggan is rather given to strange stories connected with his relations, we must remember, and I hope they can all be believed. Yes, yes, we know Coggan. But Turpin is true enough. You have never seen it played, I suppose? Never. I was not allowed to go into these places when I was young. Hark! What's that prancing? How they shout! Black Bess just started off, I suppose. Am I right in supposing you would like to see the performance, Mrs. Troy? Please excuse my mistake, if it is one. But if you would like to, I'll get a seat for you with pleasure. Perceiving that she hesitated, he added, I myself shall not stay to see it. I have seen it before. Now Bathsheba did care a little to see the show, and had only withheld her feet from the ladder because she feared to go in alone. She had been hoping that Oak might appear, whose assistance in such cases was always accepted as an inalienable right, but Oak was nowhere to be seen, and hence it was that she said, "'Then if you will just look in first to see if there's room, I think I will go in for a minute or two. And so, a short time after this, Bathsheba appeared in the tent, with Boldwood at her elbow who, taking her to a reserved seat, again withdrew. This feature consisted of one raised bench in a very conspicuous part of the circle, covered with red cloth and floored with a piece of carpet, and Bathsheba immediately found, to her confusion, that she was a single reserved individual in the tent, the rest of the crowded spectators, one and all, standing on their legs on the border of the arena, where they got twice as good a view of the performance for half the money. Hence, as many eyes were turned upon her, enthroned alone in this place of honour, against a scarlet background, 
as upon the ponies and clowns who were engaged in preliminary exploits in the centre, Turpin not having yet appeared. Once there Bathsheba was forced to make the best of it and remain. She sat down, spreading her skirts with some dignity over the unoccupied space on each side of her, and giving a new and feminine aspect to the pavilion. In a few minutes she noticed the fat red nape of Coggan's neck among those standing just below her, and Joseph Poorgrass's saintly profile a little further on. The interior was shadowy with a peculiar shade. The strange luminous semi-opacities of fine autumn afternoons and eves intensified into Rembrandt effects the few yellow sunbeams which came through holes and divisions in the canvas, and spirted like jets of gold-dust across the dusky blue atmosphere of haze pervading the tent, until they alighted on inner surfaces of cloth opposite, and shone like little lamps suspended there. Troy, on peeping from his dressing-tent through a slit for reconnoitre before entering, saw his unconscious wife on high before him as described, sitting as queen of the tournament. He started back in utter confusion, for although his disguise effectually concealed his personality, he instantly felt that she would be sure to recognise his voice. He had several times during the day thought of the possibility of some Weatherbury person or other appearing and recognising him, but he had taken the risk carelessly. If they see me, let them, he had said. But here was Bathsheba in her own person, and the reality of the scene was so much intenser than any of his prefiguring that he felt he had not half enough considered the point. She looked so charming and fair that his cool mood about Weatherbury people was changed. He had not expected her to exercise this power over him in the twinkling of an eye. Should he go on, and care nothing? He could not bring himself to do that. Beyond a politic wish to remain unknown, there suddenly arose in him now a sense of shame at the possibility that his attractive young wife, who already despised him, should despise him more by discovering him in so mean a condition after so long a time. He actually blushed at the thought and was vexed beyond measure that his sentiments of dislike towards Weatherbury should have led him to dally about the country in this way. But Troy was never more clever than when absolutely at his wit's end. He hastily thrust aside the curtain dividing his own little dressing-space from that of the manager and proprietor, who now appeared as the individual called Tom King, as far down as his waist, and as the aforesaid respectable manager thence to his toes. "'There's a devil to pay,' said Troy. "'How's that?' "'Why, there's a blackguard creditor in the tent I don't want to see, "'who'll discover me and nab me as sure as Satan if I open my mouth. "'What's to be done?' "'You must appear now, I think.' "'I can't. "'But the play must proceed. "'Do you give that Turpin has got a bad cold, and can't speak his part, "'but that he'll perform it just the same without speaking?' "'The proprietor shook his head. "'Anyhow?' "'Play or no play, I won't open my mouth,' said Troy firmly. "'Very well. Let me see. "'I'll tell you how we'll manage,' said the other, "'who perhaps felt it would be extremely awkward to offend his leading man just at this time. "'I won't tell them anything about just keeping silence. "'Go on with the piece, and say nothing, "'doing what you can by a judicious wink now and then, "'and a few indomitable nods in the heroic places, you know. "'They'll never find out that the speeches are omitted.' This seemed feasible enough, for Turpin's speeches were not many or long, the fascination of the piece lying entirely in the action, and accordingly the play began, and at the appointed time Black Bess leapt into the grassy circle amid the plaudits of the spectators. At the turnpike scene, where Bess and Turpin were hotly pursued at midnight by the officers, and the half-awake gatekeeper in his tasselled nightcap denies that any horseman has passed, Coggan uttered a broad-chested, "'Well done!' which could be heard all over the fair above the bleeding, and poor Grass smiled delightedly with a nice sense of dramatic contrast between our hero, who coolly leaps the gate, and halting justice in the form of his enemies, who must needs pull up cumbersomely and wait to be let through. At the death of Tom King he could not refrain from seizing Coggan by the hand and whispering, with tears in his eyes, "'Of course, he's not really shot, Jan, only seemingly.' and when the last sad scene came on, and the body of the gallant and faithful Bess had to be carried out on a shutter by twelve volunteers from among the spectators, nothing could restrain poor Grass from lending a hand, exclaiming as he asked Jan to join him, "'Twill be something to tell of at Warren's in future years, Jan, and hand down to her children.' 
For many a year in Weatherbury, Joseph told, with the air of a man who had had experiences in his time, that he touched with his own hand the hoof of Bess as she lay upon the board upon his shoulder. If, as some thinkers hold, immortality consists in being enshrined in others' memories, then did Black Bess become immortal that day, if she never had done so before. Meanwhile Troy had added a few touches to his ordinary make-up for the character, the more effectually to disguise himself, and though he had felt faint qualms on first entering, the metamorphosis effected by judiciously lining his face with a wire rendered him safe from the eyes of Bathsheba and her men. Nevertheless, he was relieved when it was got through. There was a second performance in the evening, and the tent was lighted up. Troy had taken his part very quietly this time, venturing to introduce a few speeches on occasion, and was just concluding it when, while standing at the edge of the circle, contiguous to the first row of spectators, he observed within a yard of him the eye of a man darted keenly into his side features. Troy hastily shifted his position, after having recognised in the scrutineer the knavish bailiff Pennyways, his wife's sworn enemy, who still hung about the outskirts of Weatherbury. At first Troy resolved to take no notice and abide by circumstances. That he had been recognised by this man was highly probable, yet there was room for a doubt. Then the great objection he had felt to allowing news of his proximity to precede him to Weatherbury in the event of his return, based on a feeling that knowledge of his present occupation would discredit him still further in his wife's eyes, returned in full force. Moreover, should he resolve not to return at all, a tale of his being alive and being in the neighbourhood would be awkward, and he was anxious to acquire a knowledge of his wife's temporal affairs before deciding which to do. In this dilemma Troy at once went out to reconnoitre. It occurred to him that to find Pennyways and make a friend of him if possible would be a very wise act. He had put on a thick beard borrowed from the establishment, and in this he wandered about the fair field. It was now almost dark, and respectable people were getting their carts and gigs ready to go home. The largest refreshment booth in the fair was provided by an innkeeper from the neighbouring town. This was considered an unexceptionable place for obtaining the necessary food and rest. Host Trencher, as he was jauntily called by the local newspaper, being a substantial man of high repute for catering through all the country round. The tent was divided into first- and second-class compartments, and at the end of the first-class division was a yet further enclosure for the most exclusive, fenced off from the body of the tent by a luncheon bar, behind which the host himself stood bustling about in a white apron and shirt-sleeves, and looking as if he had never lived anywhere but under canvas all his life. In these penetralia were chairs and a table, which, on candles being lighted, made quite a cosy and luxurious show, with an urn, plated tea and coffee-pots, china teacups and plum cakes. Troy stood at the entrance to the booth, where a gypsy woman was frying pancakes over a little fire of sticks and selling them at a penny apiece, and looked over the heads of the people within. He could see nothing of Pennyways, but he soon discerned Bathsheba through an opening in the reserved space at the further end. Troy thereupon retreated, went round the tent into the darkness, and listened. He could hear Bathsheba's voice immediately inside the canvas. She was conversing with a man. A warmth overspread his face. Surely she was not so unprincipled as to flirt in a fair. He wondered if, then, she reckoned upon his death as an absolute certainty. To get at the root of the matter, Troy took a penknife from his pocket, and softly made two little cuts crosswise in the cloth, which, by folding back the corners, left a hole the size of a wafer. Close to this he placed his face, withdrawing it again in a moment of surprise, for his eye had been within twelve inches of the top of Bathsheba's head. It was too near to be convenient. He made another hole a little to one side and lower down, in a shaded place beside her chair from which it was easy and safe to survey her by looking horizontally. Troy took in the scene completely now. She was leaning back, sipping a cup of tea that she held in her hand, and the owner of the male voice was Boldwood, who had apparently just brought the cup to her. Bathsheba, being in a negligent mood, leant so idly against the canvas that it was pressed into the shape of her shoulder, and she was, in fact, as good as in Troy's arms and he was obliged to keep his breast carefully backward, that she might not feel its warmth through the cloth as he gazed in. 
Troy found unexpected chords of feeling to be stirred again within him, as they had been stirred earlier in the day. She was handsome as ever, and she was his. It was some minutes before he could counteract his sudden wish to go in and claim her. Then he thought how the proud girl who had always looked down upon him, even whilst it was to love him, would hate him on discovering him to be a strolling player. Were he to make himself known, that chapter of his life must at all risks be kept for ever from her and from the weathery people, or his name would be a byword throughout the parish. He would be nicknamed Turpin as long as he lived. Assuredly, before he could claim her, these few past months of his existence must be entirely blotted out. "'Shall I get you another cup of tea before you start, ma'am?' said Farmer Boldwood. "'Thank you,' said Bathsheba. "'But I must be going at once. It was great neglect in that man to keep me waiting here till so late. I should have gone two hours ago, if it had not been for him. I had no idea of coming in here, but there's nothing so refreshing as a cup of tea, though I should never have got one if you hadn't helped me.' Troy scrutinized her cheek as lit by the candles, and watched each varying shade thereon, and the white shell-like sinuosities of her little ear. She took out her purse, and was insisting to Boldwood on paying for the tea for herself, when at this moment Pennyways entered the tent. Troy trembled. Here was his scheme for respectability endangered at once. He was about to leave his hole of a spile, attempt to follow Pennyways, and find out if the ex-bailiff had recognized him, when he was arrested by the conversation, and found he was too late. "'Excuse me, ma'am,' said Pennyways. "'I've some private information for your ear alone.' "'I cannot hear it now,' she said coldly. That Bathsheba could not endure this man was evident. In fact, he was continually coming to her with some tale or other, by which he might creep into favour at the expense of persons maligned. "'I'll write it down,' said Pennyways, confidently. He stooped over the table, pulled a leaf from a warped pocket-book, and wrote upon the paper in a round hand. "'Your husband is here. I've seen him. Who's the fool now?' This he folded small and handed towards her. Bathsheba would not read it. She would not even put out her hand to take it. Pennyways then, with a laugh of derision, tossed it into her lap, and, turning away, left her. From the words and actions of Pennyways, Troy, though he had not been able to see what the ex-bailiff wrote, had not a moment's doubt that the note referred to him. Nothing that he could think of could be done to check the exposure. "'Curse my luck!' he whispered, and added imprecations which rustled in the gloom like a pestilent wind. Meanwhile, Boldwood said, taking up the note from her lap, "'Don't you wish to read it, Mrs. Troy? If not, I'll destroy it.' "'Oh, well,' said Bathsheba, carelessly, "'perhaps it is unjust not to read it, but I can guess what it is about. "'He wants me to recommend him, or it is to tell me of some little scandal or other connected with my work people. "'He's always doing that.' Bathsheba held a note in her right hand. Boldwood handed towards her a plate of cut bread and butter, when, in order to take a slice, she put the note into her left hand, where she was still holding the purse, and then allowed her hand to drop beside her, close to the canvas.' The moment had come for saving his game, and Troy impulsively felt that he would play the card. For yet another time he looked at the fair hand, and saw the pink fingertips and the blue veins of the wrist, encircled by a bracelet of coral chippings which she wore. How familiar it all was to him! Then, with a lightning action in which he was such an adept, he noiselessly slipped his hand under the bottom of the tent cloth, which was far from being pinned tightly down, lifted it a little way, keeping his eye to the hole, snatched the note from her fingers, dropped the canvas, and ran away in the gloom towards the bank and ditch, smiling at the scream of astonishment which burst from her. Troy then slid down on the outside of the rampart, hastened around in the bottom of the entrenchment to a distance of a hundred yards, ascended again, and crossed boldly in a slow walk towards the front entrance of the tent. His object was now to get the pennyways, and prevent a repetition of the announcement until such time as he should choose. Troy reached the tent door, and standing among the groups there gathered, looked anxiously for Pennyways, evidently not wishing to make himself prominent by inquiring for him. One or two men were speaking of the daring attempt that had just been made to rob a young lady by lifting the canvas of the tent beside her. 
It was supposed that the rogue had imagined a slip of paper which she held in her hand to be a banknote, for he had seized it, and made off with it, leaving her purse behind. His chagrin and disappointment at discovering its worthlessness would be a good joke, it was said. However, the occurrence seemed to have become known to few, for it had not interrupted a fiddler, who had lately begun playing by the door of the tent, nor the four bowed old men with grim countenances and walking sticks in hand, who were dancing Major Malley's reel to the tune. Behind these stood Pennyways. Troy glided up to him, beckoned, and whispered a few words, and with a mutual glance of concurrence the two men went into the night together. End of chapter 50